Good evening from Wrightsville Beach. I am meteorologist Mike Seidel. We're uh, watching the sun go down on a beautiful Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday are going to actually be very nice. Typically, have you, as you have a hurricane or approach, you have a lot of sinking air. We call it compensating substance. So the weather tends to be really, really nice. And then uh, literally all hell breaks loose. We're expecting tropical storm force winds in here Wednesday evening and they'll move inland towards Raleigh. And again, combination of all the wind and rain. Look out. Speaking of rain, here in Wilmington, you've had over 62 inches of rain. There's that over five feet of rain. You're running, running well above average. In fact, it's, it's the wettest year to date. Many cities have had a lot of rain uh, so far this year. And then we're going to bring in even more rain. Look at this swath of rainfall. Now, this is a function of where exactly the hurricane makes landfall, where it moves, how much it slows down and stalls. But we're talking 12 to 18 inches of rain from here, Raleigh, Durham, and up to Roanoke. In fact, Reynolds Wolf will be in Roanoke later in the week and this weekend because we expect some major issues there. Not so much from wind that far inland by that point, but just heavy rainfall with elevation. Let's go south to Carolina Beach, an area that is very susceptible uh, to uh, storm surge. NBC's Jay Gray there is there. Jay, I suspect you will not be there on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mike, uh, it, it, like you said, beautiful right now. I mean, it's a perfect sunset here, a calm breeze. And that's the time to get ready, to get prepared. Use, uh, take advantage of these conditions because uh, as you talk about starting Wednesday, things are going to drop off significantly. Beachside, things are just about perfect right now. It's been beautiful the last few days. But the situation along the South Atlantic shoreline is expected to change dramatically. The forecast places North Carolina in the bullseye of Hurricane Florence. The storm is rapidly getting stronger. Florence is a monster, a major hurricane visible from space, churning in the Atlantic, gathering strength and pushing toward the coast. There really is a serious threat from dangerous winds dangerous coastal storm surge, and also dangerous riverine flooding caused by high amounts of precipitation. Hundreds of thousands in the strike zone are getting ready, gathering plywood to board windows and sandbags to block floodwaters. I'm worried. I want a generator. There's been a run on generators and everything else needed to ride out the storm. I got candles, I got flashlights, I got uh, tons of gallons of water. Yeah, I'm ready. Working, waiting, and watching as Florence closes in. Evacuation orders already issued for parts of the Outer Banks. That's going to expand. We know the governor in South Carolina wants the entire coastline of the state cleared out by tomorrow evening. And Alex, Dr. Nab, I think we'll see these evacuation uh, orders being issued uh, far and wide as we get closer to landfall. Yeah, we get closer. We know, uh, have more certainty on which communities are going to be affected. And there's going to be a lot of people uh, needing to yeah. find a safer place to stay. Jay Gray, thank you so much for the report. We'll check back in with Jay uh, for more on what's happening across the coastlines. And we think scenes like this will be happening along the coastlines as the Carolinas could see record storm surge from Florence. This was, of course, Hurricane Matthew in, in Jack's Beach, Florida. And you can see that push of water. It's not just the coastal locations, but areas uh, a few blocks in, in in some cases. We remember the surge video out of Big Pine Key, Florida, and the eerie sound with it. You can hear as the camera goes underwater. Dr. Nab, this goes to show you that surge isn't just a a nice steady rise, but that instead you moving. still have the waves. Yeah. yeah, and the water is powerful. It only takes about six inches of water to take a person off their feet, maybe a foot to take a vehicle off the tread uh, on the pavement. And moving water with waves on top of that can get into structures and absolutely obliterate structures. You know, we saw Katrina, the you know, things wiped off their foundation. Right. So storm surge is serious business. And just quickly wanted to show you an example of South Carolina evacuation zones. This is like in Horry County, Myrtle Beach, and down in the Georgetown area. Notice how this, these evacuation zones are not just for people who live along the beachfront. These zones go quite a ways inland, including because there are ways that the ocean can get into towns that are along rivers that have access to the ocean. Plus, it can just go over barrier islands right. into communities that are several blocks to miles inland. So important to know your zone, as the graphic yes. said, and if your zone 
is called for those evacuations go. You don't want to ride this out. We saw in so many cases with Matthew, people stayed put. Then the water came in like we knew it would, and then they found themselves needing help. But then you got to put emergency responders in harm's way. Yeah, so let's look at the complexity of the coastline here in South and North Carolina. We saw where the evacuations are there, where South and North Carolina border is. Uh, that's an area where, look at the shape of the coastline, how it can capture the storm surge, and then you can have a river capture storm surge and bring it up into Wilmington. Then you go farther north, uh, look at how Wrightsville Beach has cuts in the barrier islands that can allow the ocean to have inroads into some of the inland areas. And then eastern North Carolina, sure, it's obvious you'd want to uh, evacuate the outer banks because those barrier islands can flood due to storm surge. But these sounds are big bodies of water that can have storm surge going way inland up those rivers. A large portion of eastern North Carolina might be told to evacuate in a landfall in North Carolina can still bring storm surge up the Chesapeake. Yeah. Think Isabel, Baltimore was an example of that happening. Yeah, could get so a Hampton lot Hampton Roads. Mm. Those emergency officials, they understand the complex complexities of what's happening, and they're going to keep you safe. So if you're told to go by them, go. We've got a lot more to come as Weather Underground continues. This program brought to you by Panera Bread, food as it should be. Well, this is something we have not seen in decades, if ever. Right now, three hurricanes threatening the United States directly. Hurricane Olivia on a collision course with Hawaii, expected to be the first landfall of the week. Of course, Hurricane Florence, right now a monster Category 4 storm headed towards the U.S. southeast coast. And, of course, we've got Isaac in the Caribbean as well, edging closer and closer to Puerto Rico around the same time as Florence. Uh, just uh, got a, a tweet from the president, President Trump spoke with governors from North Carolina, South Carolina and Virginia. The federal government stands up ready to assist. So uh, the lines of communication are open between government officials, between emergency management officials, between individual communities and the general public. Make sure you're listening to the calls that are made for your areas. Uh, these officials are looking this storm. Let's get to the very latest on Hurricane Florence. As I mentioned, a Category 4 hurricane with winds at 140 miles per hour. This is moving west-northwest 13 miles an hour. So we've seen a significant strengthening from what we had yesterday. And we've also seen this pick up speed and also take on a little bit more of a west-northwestward component as opposed to due west, which we saw yesterday. We look at the forecast track and we get to the end of the week and that's when the uh, things will really deteriorate along the coast. We'll begin to see those tropical storm force winds uh, as late as, or as early as late Wednesday, but Thursday looks to be the big day as we watch this approaching storm eventually make landfall. Right now, our, our, our best estimate would be somewhere between the southern end of the Delmarva Peninsula down into north parts of South Carolina. So that's why the need to prepare extends hundreds of miles along the coast. There have been mandatory evacuations already issued for parts of the Outer Banks, including Hatteras. That started today at noon and tomorrow at 7 a.m. We include areas like Duck, Nags Head and Stumpy Point in those evacuations. Also, South Carolina schools and state offices in 26 counties, all of those shown in red from the Midlands to the Low Country, are closed Tuesday and until further notice. But of course, Florence, not the only thing we're watching. We have a Hurricane Isaac here in the Atlantic and Dr. Nab, Olivia, as well as an invest that's going to be moving into the Gulf. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we have a lot to deal with and uh, I'll start with the Eastern Caribbean. I know folks are weary and still recovering from Irma and Maria last year, but some of those same areas uh, have to deal with Isaac potentially here in the next few days. Olivia threatens Hawaii. And then I'll talk about Invest 95L, which could uh, cause trouble in the Gulf of Mexico and places like Texas in the next few days. So Isaac is a Category 1 hurricane, 75-mile-an-hour winds in the central tropical Atlantic. It's a pretty small one. And uh, that makes it a more difficult forecast than usual because, as we've talked about many times, a small hurricane can go up and down very quickly in its intensity, despite what we humans uh, forecast it to do. But in the overall sense of things, we anticipate a hurricane approaching the Windward and Leeward Islands when we get into the Thursday time frame, and maybe it will weaken after that. But regardless of its intensity, there is a chance of it bringing some very heavy rainfall, the possibility of flash floods and mudslides, regardless of whatever the wind hazard ends up being. And I hope it doesn't get stronger than this, but those, those small ones have a 
propensity to do that. So heads up in the Eastern Caribbean. And of course, everybody west of there will have to watch it if it gets into the Western Caribbean and tries to, tries to make it run into the continental U.S. or Mexico. Lots of time to get ready for that. Helene, nobody on land is going to be affected over the next few days as this makes a right-hand turn. Maybe the Azores down the line will have to deal with it. But in the meantime, ships get out of the way and everything should be okay uh, for the time being. Invest 95L is a tropical wave interacting with an upper level low over the Gulf of Mexico. So the wind shear and the land interaction will limit development in the near term, but this has better than a 50-50 shot of developing in the next five days as it gets into the western Gulf of Mexico. And my main concern is the heavy rainfall potential for Texas. That's already moist in south eastern and deep south Texas, but you add this system to the mix and you get to about Thursday and now it's on your doorstep and it could bring some very heavy rainfall uh, to that area. And also we still have the Hawaiian Islands about to deal with likely Alex, the direct impacts of what will probably be tropical storm Olivia damage, power outages, heavy rainfall and flooding. Yeah, all in play for the Hawaiian Islands as well. Let's get to one of your questions. This one coming to us on Twitter from too blessed to be stressed. Is there a possibility Florence could turn and hit northern Virginia? Uh, it is definitely a possibility. Uh, I'll give you the, the picture of where all the tracks lie in terms of the possible landfall locations. And it's anywhere in the Carolinas, certainly. Uh, but even if it makes landfall in North Carolina, it could still very easily be that the center of Florence comes over any part of Virginia. So don't assume that a landfall in North Carolina is all good news for Virginia. Uh, and uh, even if it's not strong when it gets to Virginia, you could still be dealing with the very heavy rainfall and flooding there. Yeah, it could still be a, a big deal. Thanks for the question. If you've got some, send them our way. You can use the hashtag WTV as well as the hashtag Hurricane Hughes. Oh, much more ahead on tonight's show. We continue our special coverage of Hurricane Florence. We've got live coverage from the coast. We'll check in with Mike Seidel after this. Right now on a special edition of Weather Underground, we are tracking Hurricane Florence, now a major Category 4 hurricane. A destructive strike on the southeast coast is likely. We're going to give you the very latest timing and where the threat is increasing. Now the time to prepare for life's threatening storm surge, destructive winds, and massive inland rainfall flooding. We've got live coverage from the coast. And multiple threats in the tropics. We're closely watching this area of concern in the Gulf. We'll tell you why and what it could mean for Texas. And while the focus is on the Atlantic, a significant threat is developing in Hawaii that has us concerned. It's all next on Weather Underground. Well, tonight, Category 4 Hurricane Florence on track to slam the southeast coast of the U.S. We're just days away from landfall, but we are concerned about the catastrophic impacts that are possible well after this one moves on shore. We're with you until 9 o'clock tonight, bringing you every possible breakdown of the storm here on Weather Underground. By the way, our live coverage continues after this and all night long. I'm meteorologist Alex Wilson. Our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Nab, is with us as well. I want to get you what we know when we talk about the meteorolo meteorology of this system and the meteorological impacts that we could see. Uh, Life-threatening wind and water will affect coastal and inland areas. Landfall of a major hurricane is expected. The exact details, the exact location still uncertain. Millions have been instructed to evacuate from coastal areas due to the risk of storm surge and the potential for disastrous inland flooding exists well into the mid-Atlantic states. As of the latest advisory that came in at 5 o'clock Eastern time, Florence was a Category 4 hurricane. So as we expected, this one increased in intensity in a big way over the last 24 hours and uh, now winds at 140 miles per hour. Pressure 939 millibars moving to the west northwest. So last night moving west now more of a west northwestward motion. Also picked up a little bit of speed 13 miles per hour right now. And we look at that forecast track and we still are watching parts of the Carolinas into Virginia. By the way, our hurricane hunters have been out there today on Florence and here you're looking at that stadium effect of the clouds. Uh, thanks to the Astro Nick on Twitter for sharing that one. They've been running some uh, big missions, a lot of missions and some very important information coming out of those missions. This is video from those hurricane hunters from inside the eye of Florence. So you see the clouds surrounding it, but looking up blue sky 
Now, Dr. Nav, you're in that eye. It's beautiful. You look at this thing from above. It's beautiful. But you know inside this storm, this thing is a, a, a real beast. It's very, very powerful. Well, you know, that makes it look like the ride through Hurricane is all pleasant right? and uh, clear and calm. But you know what they had to go through to get into the hurricane? And then when you're in the eye, you got to get out. Okay. And this is a very, very rough and turbulent ride through the eye wall. And I would venture to say, even though I've not done it myself, uh, that it is quite an experience when you then punch the eye wall again after you're inside the eye. And you'll, one last thing to mention about this is that when the Hurricane Hunter plane goes through the eye wall and then into the eye, they're following a constant pressure surface. And as they go down into the eye, they're going down in altitude as they follow that pressure surface. And then as they leave, they go up and punch the eye wall on the way back out. It's, it's quite a ride. Um, I, I don't think I would necessarily want to do that myself, but I certainly respect the men and women who do. And not only do we have NOAA hurricane hunters out there, we have Air Force hurricane hunters out there right now. And this is what they're flying into. And let me show you the path that they've been taking. They went from northwest to southeast did their first pass, and now you can see they've made that left-hand turn, and they're going to be doing this alpha pattern, and they're going to come in from the northeast and then go to the southwest. So within the hour, they'll go through the eye again. The northern to northeastern side is the presumably uh, stronger side of this. When they came through the northwest side within the last hour, they did get surface winds measured from that SFMR, the stepped frequency microwave radiometer, or we sometimes call it the Smurf. It can remotely sense surface wind speeds over the ocean by looking at the microwaves coming up from the ocean. And that instrument measured winds in about the 130 mile power range. So not enough for the Hurricane Center, I don't think, to make this stronger than the 140 miles an hour that was in the previous advisory. But we'll see what they get when they come in from the northeast side. Uh, in any case, that's all short term. The long term prognosis for this uh, is not good news. It is anticipated to remain a major hurricane. You can count on, in most cases, a major hurricane going through some ups and downs in its intensity. We don't know exactly what the intensity at landfall is going to be any more than we know the exact location of landfall. It could be a three, a four, or hopefully not a five. Uh, if it were to go through an eyewall replacement cycle, could it make landfall as a category two, but a larger one? It could. Uh, but in any event, it's going to be a devastating coastal and inland wind and water event, no matter how you slice it. And we've got to prepare over the next couple of days because about this time on Wednesday is the earliest reasonable time that winds of tropical storm force could arrive. And you've got to get your preparations done by then. You don't want to be outside in tropical storm conditions. So plan ahead for dealing with uh, two more days of prep time and then inland you got to be preparing as well. We're going to have some damaging winds that could take the power out way inland and the hurricane force winds also Alex are going to possibly affect not only coastal areas of the Carolinas but portions of Virginia and inland areas of the Carolinas. Just as an example Hugo in 89 brought hurricane force winds to Charlotte, North Carolina, after coming ashore just north of Charleston. So history teaches us that can happen. Yeah, we've got a lot of effects and well inland uh, communities need to be prepared. Uh, farther to the north, communities are uh, getting prepared as well. But North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper, he's been stressing the importance uh, of residents understanding the severity of Florence. Our best defense is good preparation. Preparation as a state is making sure we have enough people, enough fuel, shelters, making sure we stage resources strategically around the state. And a lot of people are making sure they have what they need. Lauren Prosiv was shopping tonight, rightfully so. Her sister's a meteorologist, and uh, she got out there and took photos of some of the empty shelves, even in Richmond. So communities are getting that message, and they are prepping in a big way. You know, some of the areas that are already getting a word that they need to leave are coastal parts of North Carolina. Parts of the Outer Banks, Mike Seidel, they've been ordered to evacuate not too far from where you are in Wrightsville Beach. The campus of UNC Wilmington, they're closing up tomorrow and telling the students to get out of town. 
coming in over the berm already, and we're three days from landfall. Uh, high tide coming up at 839. Now on Thursday, which is the day we're going to have a landfall, it may not be exactly here, maybe a little south, a little north. Uh, low tides at about 5 p.m., high tides about six hours later. So that's going to help us out uh, if it comes in a low tide. That saves us uh, four, about four and a half feet of water. So we'll just see how it times out. It's way too early to pinpoint that and where it exactly hits. But you can see the winds and the track. And again, there's still that window, uh, that, that the window and that cone. So we're not, we haven't etched this in stone, but again, this could be ground zero for the landfall here at Wrightsville Beach. It seems like the F-storms, as the mayor mentioned, we had Fran in 96. I was here for Floyd, but I was on the other side of the intercoastal. But that was a, that was a cat two when it came in in the morning down at Cape Fear. So we'll see how it all shakes out. But the tropical storm force winds expected in here on Wednesday evening, then advancing inland towards Raleigh, Durham, and uh, over towards uh, the, uh, certainly the triad uh, as we get into Friday morning. So the interior year the issue is wind and heavy rainfall uh, trees coming down and a lot of power going out right here on the beach it's the destructive nature of what could easily be hurricane force for uh, hurricane force winds and gust over 100 miles an hour for a couple of hours and that's going to put the entire beach underwater you can see the water coming back up i can tell you though it's 85 degrees it is very very warm and that's one of the reasons we had florence rapidly intensify between last night and today. The water it's going over is also running at about 85 or 86 degrees between Bermuda and the southeast coast. So there are a lot of things to worry about. Right now here in New Hanover County in Wilmington, there's a just a voluntary evacuation. The mayor told us earlier he expects the mandatory to kick in on Wednesday, and that'll get everybody off these barrier islands. Fortunately, it is after Labor Day, so not as many people in town. But uh, the concern is here, the wind, and the surge back inland, it's purely a wind story. If you're inland North Carolina and you're not in a flood zone like near a river, uh, because we expect a big surge to come up through new oasis and new rivers, much like we saw in Floyd, just stay home, uh, watch the trees, stay away from the windows, and don't venture out uh, once the flooding begins. We lost a lot of people uh, north of here in those river areas because they went out during the flooding and uh, they drown. So, Alex, we're hoping that everybody just stays put. The best place to be is in your house if you're out of a flood zone. There's no need to drive to Greenville or Richmond or Charlotte. Just stay put and uh, stay safe. Absolutely. That's the that's the best you can do. And again, we got three more days before we deal with the uh, worst of it here. Yeah, great advice, Mike Seidel. Thanks so much. And uh, Mike will be bringing us more live reports as we go through this evening and also throughout the week. Uh, he and Jim Cantori there in Wrightsville Beach. Uh, Jim will be up tomorrow morning. Now, Dr. Nab, uh, this thing has picked up some forward speed, but when we look farther in time when this makes landfall, we think it's going to slow down. And so that brings the impacts, the issues to more communities and for a prolonged period of time. Yeah, that high pressure ridge that's uh, steering Florence in our direction is also going to uh, do something else that we don't like, and that is uh, bring in another ridge uh, over the Midwest that will block the first ridge from sending this around and, and out of here. So we've got a double whammy in terms of the steering components here. So here's ridge number one. This is the first problem we have that is steering the hurricane in our direction. There's just no way this is going to recurve before getting to the coastline, I don't think, because of how strong and stout that ridge is. The steering current's very well defined, sending it in our general direction. Can't pinpoint landfall. But then look at the ridging that builds over the Midwest and southeastern Canada. So we can't round this ridge because this bigger ridge is developing. Uh, it was more and more we're seeing these high latitude ridges causing us problems not being able to get hurricanes in and then out. If we're going to deal with them, we'd like to deal with them more quickly than this. And the five day cone, you see how it hits the skids on Friday and Saturday as it's coming ashore and look at how strong it could still be as it gets over central northern uh, North Carolina into Virginia or maybe into northern South Carolina, western North Carolina. So got a lot of areas that could receive sustained winds, Alex, of tropical storm force uh, and for a long duration. That slowdown means once the tropical storm force winds start, they could last a long, long time at the coast and inland. Yeah, a, a lot of areas to be concerned about, and that extended period of time may make more people vulnerable. Uh, you've been asking us your questions using the hashtag hurricane questions, and Vaughn wants to know, I'm here in Blacksburg, and what are the impacts for us here in the mountains? The GFS says it won't be. 
says differently. Well, we look live at a place like Blacksburg uh, out on the campus of Virginia Tech this evening. You can see the sun's gone down. That's the drill field. Dr. Nam, not too long ago, we were looking at a flooded drill field and we could see problems because of water, especially maybe some gusty winds. But honestly, it's going to be a water issue that's going to be the uh, big problem in a place like Blacksburg, where we look at uh, prolonged and very, very heavy rainfall that will persist over these communities. Obviously, Blacksburg location in the mountains, too, could help to enhance some of that rainfall. Yeah, and, and you get the sense from that question that they're looking at the model, seeing if maybe this isn't going to be a problem. But you got to look at a wide variety of possible scenarios here. And there's nobody in the state of South Carolina or North Carolina or Virginia that couldn't that, that might not see the center of the circulation. Right. Anybody in any of those states, the center could go right over you. But even if it doesn't, you could easily get winds of tropical storm force taking the power out and causing some damage. Easily get very heavy rainfall for days that could cause terrible flooding in your community. So nobody in those states is off the hook. In fact, a lot of folks in, uh, surrounding those states could be dealing with heavy rainfall. This is just one model's depiction of what the rainfall could be from the European model run. But look at the wide area, even if this model is exactly right, even the surrounding areas get tremendous amounts of rainfall. So uh, my message to people inland is don't chase the models and don't uh, hope the problem away. You got to get ready over the next couple of days, just as much people uh, along the coast do for power outages and flooding. Yeah, anywhere really along the Appalachians and east, uh, it definitely in play for some serious, serious rainfall events. Uh, Houston, Texas, you're wondering, all right, wh why are you talking about us? Because uh, Florence is heading to the southeast coast, but we are watching an area, Invest 95L right now, that will be moving into the Gulf and uh, could develop if nothing else, it's going to increase moisture along parts of southeastern Texas in particular. So we could be looking at some issues due to flooding there as well. It's been a busy week in the tropics. Here is Invest 95L with winds at 30 miles per hour. This is due east of the Yucatan Peninsula. 60% chance of development now as we look at the five day development possibility. And that zone where we would see that potential development lies right over the Gulf of Mexico and close to southeast Texas. So. That's why we say regardless of whether or not this does become a tropical system, it's going to bring in a lot of moisture and a lot of rainfall as we get into the second half of the week. So here's Thursday, Friday, even into the start of the weekend, a significant rainfall possibility across parts of southern Texas. And those totals could get high around places like Corpus Christi, a half foot or more of rainfall with some locally higher totals on the order of a foot or more. So flooding will be a concern in these communities as well. That, of course, the Euro model. Here's the GFS uh, taking that rainfall areas north of Corpus Christi, closer to Houston. So again, still a, a lot to make out in terms of the exact details of where the heaviest rain will be located. But what we do know is that we think we will be looking at heavy rain across parts of the Gulf Coast of Texas. And many of you at home have been sending us your questions. Please continue to do that. We're going to be answering them throughout the show hashtag hurricane questions and if not on this show other shows here on the weather channel we want to be answering your questions that you have about florence 95 l or whatever you may be worried about also we've got tropical storm olivia headed towards hawaii well coming up on weather underground dr nab is going to go in depth on how to survive the worst of hurricane florence from storm surge to destructive winds and inland flooding we have life-saving information you need to know right now Welcome back to around the clock 24 seven coverage here on the Weather Channel of Hurricane Florence and already the water going over the berm. We've got high tide here in about 20 minutes uh, here on the North Carolina coast and many, many folks concern and we expect a mandatory evacuation here at Riceville Beach to kick in on Wednesday. Uh, as the surf comes in, it erodes away the beach and these waves are nothing. Uh, I checked the marine forecast from the Weather Service and the just offshore waters. Wave heights could be as high as 30 feet as Florence approaches. Uh, so we're looking at the potential uh, for this beach just being literally erased. They just pump sand in here back in the winter and uh, the beachfront property, destructive winds. Inland areas uh, will have wind, but then that'll die down and you get into Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro, over to Roanoke, um, Danville, Virginia, one of those spots. It's going to be in that swath right now based on the current track of rainfall totals a foot or more. So inland, it's going to be the heavy rain and the flooding all because 
Florence is going to slow down. The ridge is steering it now quickly uh, towards the coast, but then that's going to break down. The steering it kind of loiters and festers and rains itself out. We've seen what happens, Alex, just last year in Houston with Harvey. Uh, so uh, be prepared for some uh, totals, rainfall totals that could top out easily over 20 inches. You bet. Mike Seidel, something that we will absolutely be watching for and what we're watching for in the days to come of preparation are for, you know, people to, to take the time and the energy to do things to protect their home. But something we see so often that you don't actually want to do is taping up windows. This is not the best way, Dr. Nab, to, ta to protect your windows. Instead, you want to go with plywood or shutters. Yeah, um, the reason you don't want to tape your windows is because it's not going to stop the glass from breaking. It's just not. And if the projectiles go through the window and break your window, tape or not, that's bad news. But if there's tape on the windows, then the pieces that break are going to be larger mm -hmm. and deadlier. So, and, we're, and when we're talking about being safe from the wind, we're not just talking about people at the coast. Look at how far inland winds of tropical storm force could ex extend, that's sustained. Gusts could be stronger. Look how far inland hurricane force winds could extend. So we're talking to folks not just at the coast. When we tell you to cover your windows with shutters or fit to cut plywood, not tape. And when a major hurricane is coming ashore, Alex, there's something that the Weather Service can issue on just a few hours notice that's called an extreme wind warning. And it's like a tornado warning. Mm -hmm. So get ready to take shelter during the height of the storm, like you would for a tornado, and even in tropical storm conditions. You saw that map, how far inland those could go. Don't stay in a mobile home. Nobody should be in the upper floors of a high rise during a hurricane, and consider leaving any structure you don't feel safe in from the wind. Yeah, if, if you think I've got an older home, I don't know if it's built to standard, just find a safe spot. Give yourself that peace of mind. Uh, surge, obviously, one of the other big concerns when we look at threats from these storms. And uh, Jim Eds took this incredible video just during the Herm Hurricane Irma last year. Uh, just about a year ago, Big Pine Key. You saw that rush of water. We see the water rise, but you also see how quickly that water's moving. Wow, and water is so powerful, and we, we often aren't afraid enough of it. Mm -hmm. and, and we urge people to evacuate when they're told to do so because that storm surge is relatively uh, benign compared to what could happen uh, in a landfalling Cat 4 in this particular case. Right could be waves on top of that could absolutely destroy structures. So you've got to find out now if you're in an evacuation zone, if you don't already know. And don't assume just because you can't see the ocean that it can't come to you. Storm surge can go blocks to miles inland. And then decide right now where you go and how you get there if you're told to evacuate. And when you're deciding on where you're going to go, consider special needs you might have that you need to have right. at that shelter if you have medical equipment or you need to be close to medical care. Uh, in a, if you're in a safe place, you're inland, out of a storm surge zone, strong home, not a flood prone area, why don't you be an inland right. evacuation destination? Because people are going to be looking for places to stay, yeah. you know, and the shelters, the hotels might be full or just not in the right place. Yeah, you know, you, you, people have the medical needs, they need power. People have a lot of pets or, or different pets, you know. I've got three dogs, so I know that I would need to find somebody who's going to accommodate that. So if you've got a, a safe spot, be that open door, somebody could hopefully do it for you. Yeah, and, um, uh, you know, one last thing we didn't mention is don't evacuate vertically in a high rise. Yes, <laughs> Just yes. not a good idea. Yeah. So uh, Hawaii, we got another issue to deal right. with. Yeah, we are looking at a tropical storm now, Olivia, making its way closer to the Hawaiian Islands. And this one offers up uh, a few threats to Hawaii. One, the wind, of course, that could uh, lead to power outage troubles. But then we've also got that possibility for flooding rainfall. Uh, tropical storm warnings, Dr. Nab, they're issued for all the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah, and this is uh, a pretty serious situation. Even though we uh, have been through Lane, uh, this is a totally different scenario. This right. is something coming in from the east northeast. And, and that's an unusual track, correct? It is, it is, uh, for something to hold together that mm -hmm. long. And uh, while we don't think this is gonna be a landfalling hurricane because it's not even a hurricane anymore, uh, it is still a tropical storm, and you mix that with the Hawaiian Islands with a vulnerable power grid with uh, a lot of trees that can be taken down uh, and homes that aren't used to dealing with strong winds. We could have damage and power outages as this moves in. And it's got a little bit of warm water left before it gets to the islands to keep it alive. And this could also uh, bring strong winds to all the islands, but also 
heavy rainfall and uh, flash flooding and mudslides. So tropical storm warning, Maui County, Big Island, tropical storm watch for Oahu. But no matter what island you're on, no matter what part of what island you're on, you could get flash flooding and mudslides. Out. Very well, careful. A, a lot of threats are going to come with Olivia uh, with that uh, tropical storm force winds and the rain. All right, much more on Hurricane Florence as our special coverage continues. This hurricane is likely to have impacts statewide, not just our coastal areas, but south side, southwest Virginia are likely to be affected as well. Everyone in Virginia needs to prepare. Well, in Norfolk, the Navy started moving ships out from ports. Almost 30 ships are going to leave the Naval Station in Norfolk and Joint Expeditionary Base Little Creek. The ships will be sent to areas in the Atlantic, in the Atlantic Ocean, I should say, where they can avoid the storm. So everybody and everything getting out of harm's way. We welcome you back to Weather Underground and our coverage of Hurricane Florence, a major hurricane expected to make landfall about three days from now. Latest update from the National Hurricane Center came in at 5 o'clock Eastern time. Winds of 140 miles per hour. So we have seen really significant strengthening over the past 24 hours. The pressure down to 939 millibars, moving west-northwest at 13 miles per hour. So this a really exceptional storm as it makes its way closer to the U.S. And Dr. Nab, uh, hard to imagine any scenario where we don't look at a landfall from a very powerful storm at this point. Yeah, it, it, I, you start to run out of words to describe how serious this is. Right. Um, but we have to keep saying it because I'm sure there are still people who are thinking, is this really going to be as bad as you're saying? And uh, do I really need to uh, do all these things? Uh, is this really going to happen? And uh, we can't say it strongly enough. Uh, we don't want anybody uh, to uh, be interviewed afterward and saying, oh, well, I just didn't know it could be this bad. We're saying right now this could really be that bad at the coast and inland, wind and water, they're all in play. And as partial evidence for how seriously this should be taken, the hurricane hunters are going to be flying this nearly continuously all the way up to landfall. And they're making these very, very long flights in, in treacherous conditions going into this hurricane. And uh, they have confirmed essentially what the uh, previous advisory showed is that this is a category four. Now, it hasn't recently found strong winds because it's been going on the eastern side. It's about to turn back in from the northeast. But in a few minutes, they'll be coming in from the northeast and we'll see if they find winds that are as strong as the 140 miles an hour. They found 130 in the northwest side uh, a little over an hour ago. Uh, regardless, uh, the prognosis for this remaining major hurricane, uh, we're pretty confident about that uh, as it goes over warm water with weak shear. And it's going to be very well-defined steering currents. We're very confident about where it's going and coming ashore. Um, and we're also, unfortunately, very confident that once it gets to the coastline, it's going to slow down dramatically. And look at these major metropolitan areas. And even if you don't get the direct landfall, which could occur somewhere in the Carolinas, for example, you could still get maybe tropical storm, maybe even hurricane force winds in some of these areas inland. So you've got to be preparing for at least tropical storm conditions over a huge area of the mid-Atlantic and up into the northeast. Uh, and that means the potential for power outages. Don't operate a generator indoors, outdoors only, not in the garage, away from the building. Don't plan on using candles or any other open flame during a power outage. Afterwards, stay away from down power lines and anything that's touchy, including water. And take shelter where there's a backup power source if you need uh, medical equipment and need power for that. So, Alex, these are really important things that uh, could help you survive and deal with what could be a long aftermath after the winds happen and after the power goes out. Yeah, if we see a, a lot of power outages like we think is possible, it's going to take those crews some time. So make sure you have what you need uh, to have that patience to let those crews get things up and going. want to take you to what's happening in Kaloa, Hawaii right now. On the other side of the... Uh of the continental US. We look at the Pacific Ocean and we've been watching what was Hurricane Olivia now updated uh, tropical storm Olivia. We've got tropical storm warnings out for a lot of the Hawaiian islands and we think this could be 
a serious threat to the Hawaiian Islands. Yes, and this change from hurricane to tropical storm was anticipated. Mm -hmm. It was not anticipated that it would remain a hurricane all the way to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, but uh, this tropical storm being as close to Hawaii as it is is certainly alarming. And we've also got Isaac and a system trying to develop in the uh, Western Caribbean headed toward the Gulf. So here's our 70 mile an hour tropical storm still moving westward. Here's the Hawaiian Islands and you look at it looks kind of disheveled, but uh, it's it's been sampled by aircraft earlier today that it, it, it found it still a hurricane a few hours ago and there's no reason to believe that with these warm waters it can't hold together and bring tropical storm conditions to one or more of the islands where we have tropical storm warnings in effect and a tropical storm watch for Oahu and this is serious business in Hawaii. It's easy to get power outages in all of these islands and unfortunately pretty easy to get damage to some of the structures who are not used to dealing with strong winds and any of the islands typical windward side or typical leeward side could get heavy rainfall and flash flooding and mudslides. So this is a serious deal. Hopefully folks in Hawaii are getting very, very ready for this one. Yeah, I need to prep once again. Now all, all preps underway as well across parts of the East Coast. That's where meteorologist Mike Seidel is. He's in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina as all eyes are on Florence there. Hey Alex, imagine that just two weeks ago we had nothing in the Atlantic base, not even a depression. Now we have three hurricanes. The one of real concern is Florence. We'll come back here and update the status of these beaches and what's ahead next on the Weather Channel. Back here in Wrightsville Beach, I'm meteorologist Mike Seidel from the Weather Channel. We are around the clock now through Friday into the weekend as Florence heads this way. We're not sure exactly where it's going to make landfall, but uh, if you're watching us anywhere from Myrtle Beach to the Outer Banks, that seems to be the zone of landfall. And to the right or north of landfall is where we have the highest surge. The water tonight with high tide right about now, 839 Eastern, is already coming over the berm. And you walk from where I am towards uh, the street, and there's a huge lake of water that's been like a catch-all. You've seen that on the beach. It's kind of nice to play in. The little kids like to play it on a hot summer day. Well, that's going to be nothing compared to what we have to deal with on Thursday, regardless of if it comes in north or south. This whole beach will be underwater. And then the inland flood impact, a serious concern. I remember Floyd. I was just over the bridge when Floyd came right over us. The eye, that was the Cat 2, September of 1999, and what happened here with these beaches. But inland, the Noose River, uh, the New River, the surge came up the river, and then we had upwards of 20 plus inches of rain, which caused tremendous flooding, and we lost a lot of lives by people who ventured out in the flooding long after the hurricane winds had died down. So just remember that, Alex, uh, as we get into Friday and the weekend, there's going to be a lot of flooding. And that is going to cause problems. You need to sit tight. If you're not in a flood prone area, you're fine if, as long as you're out of the surge zone. Speaking of the surge zone, let's go down the coast about eh, 15, 20 miles. Beautiful spot, Carolina Beach <laughs> near Cape Fear. And that spot is even more susceptible to uh, erosion and overwash. Let's check in with NBC's Jay Gray. Hey there, Mike. No, you're absolutely right. A beautiful night right now, and that official say is the time to get ready. Use these conditions to your advantage. Make sure you're prepared. Things like starting late Wednesday into Thursday. Beachside, things are just about perfect right now. It's been beautiful the last few days. But the situation along the South Atlantic shoreline is expected to change dramatically. The forecast places North Carolina in the bullseye of Hurricane Florence. The storm is rapidly getting stronger. Florence is a monster, a major hurricane visible from space, churning in the Atlantic, gathering strength and pushing toward the coast. There really is a serious threat from dangerous winds, dangerous coastal storm surge, and also dangerous riverine flooding caused by high amounts of precipitation. Hundreds of thousands in the strike zone are getting ready, gathering plywood to board windows and sandbags to block floodwaters. I'm worried. I want a generator. There's been a run on generators and everything else needed to ride out the storm. I got candles. I got flashlights. I got uh, tons of gallons of water. Yeah, I'm ready. Working, waiting, and watching as Florence closes in. Okay, so just talked to some really nice locals, just took a last little stroll on the beach. You say they live right here, maybe 100 yards from where I'm talking to you. 
they're packing up. They're leaving in the morning. They're driving all the way to Charlotte. They don't want to be here. He said, if it's a two, I'm fine. We're getting up to four. I, I think I'm going to leave. And I think, Alex, a lot of people are, are starting to think that way as well. Tomorrow, I think, would be a big moving day here. I think we'll see a lot of people heading to higher ground. Yeah, and I'm seeing a lot of chatter on social media from people who said, you know, anything that's that I'm left with after a storm, as you hear from these people who rode it out during the hurricane, and they go, boy, I wish I didn't stay. Right. Yeah, Jay Gray, thank you so right. much. We're going to be checking in with you throughout the week as uh, people there in North Carolina try to prepare. Carolinas could be getting in on some record storm surge from Florence. This, of course, was Jacksonville Beach, Florida during Hurricane Matthew back in 2016. Uh, that was uh, an exceptional event in that uh, North Florida community. And remember, Matthew didn't actually make landfall. We got very, very close, so we had wind issues, power outages, surge along the North Florida coastline and into parts of the Carolinas, you know also Georgia. Storm surge makes it into the community. It's yes. not just the beachfront properties. Right, not it's just going. that hotel on the beach, but no. rather blocks inward. And Dr. Now, we can't forget this video from Big Pine Key last year during Irma. This is stunning, it's scary. Um, that view right there is a picture of what it would be like if you were in storm surge waters that are now going most of the way up your body and who knows what's in that water and it's moving and uh, with that much power it can you know gut the first floors of structures or if it's high enough surge with high enough waves it can just wipe structures off their foundations in some cases. And we're looking at some communities, some parts of the coastline here that could be very vulnerable during this storm, during Florence. Yeah, you know, in order to ascertain what storm surge is going to occur at any one location, you'd have to know the exact point of landfall, the exact strength and size of the hurricane, but you'd also have to know uh, the shape of the coastline where it's coming ashore. So how the coastal areas interact with the hurricane and the ocean are very complex from spot to spot. And that's why some places the storm surge can go just blocks inland. Mm -hmm. Some places it can go miles and miles inland. Look down in the Myrtle Beach uh, area up into the Wilmington area. See the shape of that coastline, how it can capture some of the storm surge. And then some of the storm surge can go up the river into the Wilmington area. And then eastern North Carolina, sure, the outer banks, those narrow islands can get flooded by storm surge. But these sounds are big bodies of water connected to rivers, the surge can be pushed way up river. And so all these areas might be asked, asked to evacuate. Yeah, um, keep in mind the evacuation orders are coming with your safety in mind. So if you get them, get to that safe spot. Much more ahead as Weather Underground continues next. We'll take a look at this, something we have not seen in a long time, if ever. Right now, three intense tropical cyclones threatening the United States directly. We've got Tropical Storm Olivia on a collision course with Hawaii. That's expected to be the first landfall this week. Could bring power outages and heavy flooding rain to the islands. Then, of course, Hurricane Florence. That rapidly intensified. It's on track to hit the southeast in just a matter of days as a major hurricane. We're also watching Hurricane Isaac moving through the Caribbean. That'll be getting closer to Puerto Rico by the end of the week. Florence, of course, the main attraction, so to speak, a 145, uh, 140 mile per hour hurricane at this point. That's a category four hurricane as of the latest update. And we're awaiting a new update from the National Hurricane Center. That'll come in at 11 o'clock Eastern. Uh, so we'll be watching that. Uh, we've got a, a collision course expected along the southeast coast. Uh, the states of Virginia, North Carolina, as well as South Carolina as we move through the next few days. So the uh, time to prepare is right now, and you need to get ready for a major hurricane that could be making landfall in your community. If you live anywhere from South Carolina, really up towards the Delmarva Peninsula, there is a look at Hurricane Florence right now, and you can see looking like a textbook hurricane. You look at this and you know you are dealing with something significant. There's that forecast cone, that's why I say anywhere from South Carolina into the Delmarva needs to be ready for what Florence could bring. And areas inland also up against flooding rainfall and potential power outages. We get you into central North Carolina, south central Virginia, and we could still be dealing with winds and heavy rain that will be flooding communities uh, from the Appalachians, points east, even up into the northeast. So even beyond the cone, places like Pennsylvania could be looking at significant impacts. Already coastal evacuations have been ordered around the Outer Banks. Some of those in yellow started today at noon. The orange shaded areas, those are evacuations that begin tomorrow at 7. 
7 a.m. Eastern Time. And in South Carolina, public schools and state offices are closed in 26 counties from the Midlands to the Low Country. They're closed tomorrow until further notice. So uh, Dr. Nab Florence, of course, has gotten most of the attention, but there have been a, a few other threats that have developed or are worth watching in the coming days across the Atlantic and Pacific. Yeah, the people in the Hawaiian Islands, the people in the Eastern Caribbean, people in the area of, of Texas and Louisiana, they're all paying Sorry. attention to things going on in the tropics and legitimately so because we've got multiple systems that will be affecting land over the next several days in addition to Florence and in some cases on about the same time frame. So let's take a look first at Hurricane Isaac in the central tropical Atlantic Ocean. It's hanging on uh, every once in a while. The thunderstorm activity wanes and it looks like maybe this small hurricane might start to fall apart, but then it makes a comeback. So. Uh, as it moves westward at 14 miles an hour, it'll be getting closer and closer to the windward and leeward islands. And the Hurricane Center's official forecast takes it right over uh, the Eastern Caribbean islands. Don't know who's going to get uh, the strongest winds or who's going to get the worst of the heavy rainfall that could lead to flash floods and mudslides. But uh, everybody in the Eastern Caribbean needs to watch this one closely because uh, it could hang on and make it all the way there as a hurricane. And even if it does weaken after getting to the windward and leeward islands, it could bring uh, some very heavy rainfall to places like Puerto Rico. Uh, obviously, all of these areas still dealing with the recovery from last year's Irma and Maria and don't need this right now. But unfortunately, we've got to face the reality that it's coming. Um, Helene is right behind it. Is it going to follow in the footsteps of Isaac? Uh, fortunately, no. This is going to be hanging a right, and maybe the Azores will deal with it later on. Uh, but we're a little more confident with Helene than we were with Florence that this will not uh, make a left-hand turn and head toward the Western Atlantic. Won't rule that out, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Invest 95L is a tropical wave over the Western Caribbean, interacting with an upper-level low over the Gulf. So for the short term, it's got some wind shear and land interaction with Yucatan to deal with, but after it gets into the central and then western Gulf of Mexico, increasing chances that this becomes a depression or storm. Now, maybe it does that over the central part of the Gulf, or maybe it waits till nearly the last minute to become a depression or storm. So this is one of those, Alex, where we might get advisories on a potential tropical cyclone right. before possibly getting named. But I'm most worried about rainfall in deep south Texas. Remember Brownsville? got flooding rainfall yeah. disaster a couple months ago and never had a name. Yeah, this is an area we're also going to be watching very closely. We'll give you updates as we get closer. Time now for you to ask us some questions. Jeff wants to know, can this become a Category 5 storm and what are the chances? Uh, it very well could. I mean, actually, you know, the Hurricane Center is forecasting this to be right at the top end of Category 4. Could it get up to Category 5? Sure. Expect major hurricanes to have ups and downs, but just plan for a major hurricane 3, 4, hopefully not 5 at landfall. Yeah, a lot of uh, preparations underway because of uh, what this storm could bring in. I think that's why the urgency we're hearing it from the officials at those states and those uh, declar uh, emergency declarations already yeah. coming through. Keep remembering coastal and inland wind and water for days. Yeah, and our Weather Channel team will be with you around the clock for full coverage of Hurricane Florence. Carl Parker and Jackie Jarris are up next. They'll have the next advisory that comes down at 11 o'clock Eastern. Also, our team in the field will have you covered. A dangerous and potentially catastrophic hurricane now just days away. And if you live in any of these locations, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, Nags Head, North Carolina, and Virginia Beach, Virginia, you need to be preparing now. And in some of these areas, get ready to evacuate over the next 12 hours. Time is running out. This huge monster hurricane is moving closer and it's growing stronger by the hour. Thanks for being with us tonight. I'm meteorologist Jackie Jarris. We're going to be live around the clock now tracking Hurricane Florence. There's a lot of important information that we need to get through and continues to pour in here at the Weather Channel. But before we get to Carl Parker, we want to get you updated on what we know. The South Carolina governor ordered everyone off the coast beginning at noon tomorrow. That includes about a million people. In North Carolina, there's mandatory evacuation orders for Hatteras Island and Dare County. There's a state of emergency in North Carolina now, along with Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina. 
And along the coast of North Carolina, preparations are underway as we speak. This is Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. Some are boarding up tonight, preparing boats for the destructive winds that are on the way. Well, let's bring in our storm specialist, Carl Parker, and he's going to bring us up to date with the latest on Florence. Carl? Jackie, this could not be any more serious than it is. We're talking about a monster of a storm that is on the way for the U.S. coastline. It's going to be moving in in a few days, and along with it, we expect to see incredible impacts in terms of wind and surge and very heavy rain as the storm slows down. Now, 140 mile per hour category 4 hurricane moving west northwest at 13 miles per hour. This is the latest forecast track and in intensities from the National Hurricane Center could very well be a category 4 or a category 5 over the next couple of days as it keeps up its present speed and moves towards Winds to affect the coastline as early as late Wednesday, but certainly so during the day on Thursday and then into the day on Friday as well. And it could very well be a category four storm as it comes towards the coast. Now, very important thing about this cone here. This is not an impacts cone. We're not showing you where we think the impacts are going to be. Rather, we're looking at the track of the storm and the average forecast error as you get out to this length of time. So the center of the storm could be anywhere within that area just based on the average forecast errors. And in fact, I'll show you that the European Ensemble guidance does show a fair amount of spread at this time. One really important thing to notice here, a couple of important things. One is that we could be talking about a Category 4 hurricane coming in, so that would mean a tremendous impact from storm surge, very strong winds as well. And then notice going from Thursday evening into Friday evening and then into Saturday evening, look how little the storm moves over that period of time, over that 48 hour period of time, the storm barely moves up into North Carolina and into southern parts of Virginia, which means that you're going to see a tremendous amount of very heavy rain and inland flooding is going to be an enormous threat from this storm. And we're going to be talking about threats that linger well after the time the storm makes landfall. So certainly tremendous impact from the storm making landfall, but it's going to go on well past that and right into the weekend. Here is the European Ensemble guidance. So what they do with the European models, they rerun the model 51 times to account for possible errors getting into the model. And you see this spread that is the result. And there's still a fair amount of spread there. So we don't know exactly where that most dangerous core of the storm is going to be coming coming in later this week. It's still possible that it comes in somewhere in South Carolina as well as North Carolina and maybe even into Virginia. And remember that it's not a point. There are going to be impacts that are felt well away from the center of the storm. Let's take a look at the satellite picture. Notice how the high cloud is fanning out in all directions. There is little to no wind shear over the storm right now, and we expect that it's going to continue to be that way over the next few days. Wind shear is not going to hold the storm back in terms of intensity. You look at the core of this thing, very, very well formed storm. You see what's called the central dense overcast right there. Very tall thunderstorms all around that eye wall. This is one mean storm and it looks like it's going to stay that way right as it moves up and towards the coastline. The only thing that we don't know for sure is will there be changes in the internal dynamics of the storm? Sometimes you see some changes that way that can bring down the intensity a little bit, but then we also tend to see the wind field expanding in that case. So you don't always uh, win in that case, even if you do see what is called an eyewall replacement cycle. Now, this is a look at the water temperatures off the coast here, and you notice that they're well up into the 80s. So there's more than enough fuel to keep the storm very strong as it approaches the coastline. And then when we look at the wind shear in the atmosphere, that's one thing that can really tear a storm apart. We see very strong winds aloft, well off to the north there, coming through the lakes and also out into the northern part of the Atlantic. But when you look at the atmosphere around the storm itself, you've got a big ridge of high pressure aloft and what is called a little bit of an outflow channel right in there. And so everything is going to be favorable for the storm to be very strong as it approaches the coastline. And in fact, when we look at the model intensity guidance, when you see a lot of spread in that model guidance, you can say, well, maybe the models aren't getting a good handle on this. We are not seeing that in this case. What we're seeing is a very tight cluster 
clustering of that model guidance showing that this storm is almost certainly going to be a major hurricane as it comes into the coastline later this week. We're going to talk more about the impacts in a moment. Jackie, over All right. to you. Look forward to it. Thanks, Carl. Well, preparations are already underway in North Carolina. NBC's Jay Gray is in Carolina Beach. Jay, what's the latest there? Hey there, Jackie. Well, you can see the boardwalk behind me just about empty at this point. Uh, there's a mandatory evacuation that goes into effect here in Carolina Beach at 7 in the morning. Just talked to a couple who said they're going to get out at 7 in the morning. They're ready to move to higher ground. Uh, that's what officials are saying. Now's the time to prepare while conditions are great because things are going to go from bad to worse very quickly here. Beachside, things are just about perfect right now. It's been beautiful the last few days. But the situation along the South Atlantic shoreline is expected to change dramatically. The forecast places North Carolina in the bullseye of Hurricane Florence. The storm is rapidly getting stronger. Florence is a monster, a major hurricane. Base churning in the Atlantic, gathering strength and pushing toward the coast. There really is a serious threat from dangerous winds dangerous coastal storm surge, and also dangerous riverine flooding caused by high amounts of precipitation. Hundreds of thousands in the strike zone are getting ready, gathering plywood to board windows and sandbags to block floodwaters. I'm worried I want a generator. There's been a run on generators and everything else needed to ride out the storm. I got candles, I got flashlights, I got uh, tons of gallons of water. Yeah, I'm ready. Working, waiting, and watching as Florence closes in. Yeah, and again, mandatory evacuation goes into effect here early tomorrow morning. Okay, uh, we just lost the audio there with Jay Gray. Uh, Jay, so much, thanks so much for that report. We'll get back to you a little bit later if we can. All right, we want to switch gears and go back to our storm specialist, Carl Parker. Carl, there's so many different hazards associated with Florence. You know, we've got winds, we've got wave, we've got inland flood threat, and this, this is not just a coastal storm for sure. No, absolutely not, and it could be that the inland flood threat is the biggest part of this storm in the, in the broader view because the storm is going to produce so much rain over several days. We're going to talk more about that in a moment, but let's focus in on the winds first of all, and these are the tropical storm force wind probabilities from the National Hurricane Center. Now, this is all dependent on the best guess as to where the storm is going to go, and that could still change yet as the model guidance changes as the upper features are uh, painted a little bit differently by the models. We might see a little bit of a shift uh, either to the north or maybe even to the south, so that's something that we'll be watching for, but right now it looks like the highest probability Probabilities for tropical storm force winds are centered over North Carolina, but also extending into parts of Virginia and into parts of South Carolina and well inland as well. And remember that the storm, as it comes in, it's going to be moving fairly quickly, but then it's really going to slow down and that's going to keep that wind there in eastern parts of the Carolinas and also southern Virginia for a couple of days. Hurricane force wind probabilities right now are highest into the eastern part of North Carolina. But again, that could change depending on the exact track of the storm. And we think that those tropical storm forest winds could begin to move in as early as late Wednesday, as Wednesday evening. So you've got to be done with your preparations. You've got to be off those barrier islands by that time. It's going to be very, very difficult to do anything as those stronger winds come in. And model forecast certainly does bear that out. This is a look at one of our high resolution models here. And you can see how we've got some stronger winds. That wind field starting to get towards the coast there late on Wednesday. And then the uh, most dangerous core of the storm really starting to come in as we get into Thursday and those hurricane force winds going into Thursday evening and then right into Friday as well. So, Jackie, again, a prolonged period of impacts as the storm is really going to be slowing down once it hits the coast. Absolutely. So from wind to water, let's talk about how those winds push the ocean up over the shore. We're talking about storm surge flooding that is going to be a, a real life-threatening issue here as this thing makes landfall. Now, 
want to step you through time here and we're starting out overnight Wednesday and into Thursday morning and this is the wave heights and you can see the center just how high those waves may be. They could be as high as 30 to 40 feet. Of course that's going to be offshore but let's explain what storm surge is and the type of impacts. It's a really complex uh, kind of thought process and there are many different factors that are involved in storm surge but most of the worst of the surge is always in the right front quadrant of the storm. So we focus in the areas where the winds which rotate cyclonically right uh, move that water and push that water from the ocean onto the shoreline. In addition to that, we have to account for the forward speed of the storm as well. So that adds to that push of that water, making it uh, come up and move over the shelf and right onto the coastal areas and inundated. And that inundation can be anywhere from a couple of feet to as much as 30 feet at times, depending on the size of the storm, depending on the strength of the storm, depending on the coastline and all kinds of different intricate features. And one of the big concerns in the Carolinas here is that very much of the coast and even inland is really low elevation below 10 feet as highlighted here into the yellow areas. And then take a look at all the islands. Take a look at all the little inlets as well as the rivers. So that water gets pushed from the ocean up into those bays, up into those rivers, so we can get storm surge uh, well inland away uh, from the coastline. Now, one of the biggest concerns I have about Florence is what it could do down the line as we're expecting this thing to kind of stall out and produce a lot of freshwater flooding. So let's go back to Carl for more on that. Yeah, Jackie, I want to show you one of the most troubling maps that we've got uh, as regards this storm, and this is the rainfall forecast from the European model. Remember, we talked about, as Jackie mentioned, storm is really going to slow down between Friday and Saturday and Sunday. It's just very, very slowly going to move off to the northwest or maybe to the north. And when a tropical system slows down, it's got so much moisture then you get this prolonged period of heavy rain. And this is the European model total precipitation forecast. This is going from Wednesday into Saturday. And what you're looking at here are absolutely enormous areas of 8 to 12 inches of rain and 12 to 18 within that. So we tend to focus on the coastline a lot of times when we talk about hurricanes and what's going to happen on the coastline. The impacts here are going to be well inland through much of the state of North Carolina potentially as well as into Virginia, West Virginia into mountainous terrain. So we could be talking about life threatening flash flooding that's going to be developing with this storm well after the point when it makes landfall. So this is a, a very serious part of this upcoming storm. Jackie, over to you. All right, Carl. Well, as preparations continue for Hurricane Florence, Dr. Rick Nabb has these surviving the storm tips when it comes to power outages and inland flooding. Let's be thinking about how to survive power outages. Uh, number one is generators. I, I know a lot of people have been buying them, but you've got to operate them safely. Carbon monoxide kills. It has wiped out entire families. Seems like every hurricane we lose yeah. somebody due every to storm carbon we get monoxide. a memo about uh, improper use it's one of those things you've really got to got to think about where and how you're using yeah it. and when we when we say outdoors we mean outdoors not in the garage away from the building outside don't use candles or other open flames too much risk of a fire uh, stay away from down power lines and anything they're touching including water and take shelter where there's backup power if you have life-sustaining medical equipment. A lot of fatalities, especially among our elderly citizens, have happened uh, when they uh, were sheltering someplace, the power was out, and then something they needed to keep them alive no longer worked. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's a, one of the big problems we saw post-Maria. But you've got you to get creative when you think about what you might need. Flooding, of course, that's our, our one of our biggest concerns. This, of course, the scenes after Hurricane Matthew. Scary pictures. Yeah, entire communities underwater, essentially. And, and we lost a lot of lives right. in Matthew in cars, including some people who drive around barricades, right. uh, who drove around barricades that said road closed. So that's uh, you know, something we've got to keep in mind. So this is the area that could get some very heavy rainfall and flooding. So don't drive onto any 
water covered road no matter how much water you think is covering mm -hmm. the road don't drive around any barricade that says road closed don't walk don't bike don't play in the water don't cross or enter floodwaters of any kind you just don't know what's in there right and it's uh, it's gross it's carrying bacteria yeah. at best something worse at worst yeah. and you might be told to evacuate on short notice if flooding has occurred in your community but if you're trapped in your home call 911 don't get in your car mm -hmm. if you know you're driving into flooding and then don't touch anything electrical that's wet or mm -hmm. if you're standing in water don't touch something electrical right that can be really dangerous if flooding's entering your home we have more continuing live coverage as Hurricane Florence bears down on the East Coast. We're hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. We don't know what's going to happen, but we know this. The state response mechanism is in gear and is ready, and we want all the people to, to, to be smart. And Welcome back to the Letter Channel's continuing live coverage here as Hurricane Florence gets closer and closer. Guys, this is a monster, and it's not just going to bring life-threatening conditions to the coast, but well inland. We're talking this beast over 500 miles wide, so don't just focus on the center, but keep in mind we are not only going to be dealing with the coastal threat, but the inland flooding. And even here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are, we're going to be dealing with impacts directly related to Florence as well. We're talking power outages and especially heavy rainfall. As far as what we know right now when it comes to Charlotte, this is going to be an evacuation city that a lot of people at the coast who are under mandatory evacuations are going to be fleeing to. You might want to even think about going further than Charlotte or maybe heading south to Florida to get out of harm's way completely. We do know the Charlotte Motor Speedway is welcoming uh, evacuees here in Charlotte. That began at noon today, and a lot of college football games have now been canceled, including UNC and UCF. That was uh, supposed to be on Saturday. That has been canceled. Uh, North Carolina State at West, uh, hosting West Virginia has been canceled. Uh, Wake Forest Boston College will play on Thursday, but their game got shifted two hours earlier at 530, and we also got word that UNC Charlotte has canceled classes beginning tomorrow afternoon. So Thursday, Friday, classes canceled here in Charlotte because of Florence. So we want to take it down to the coast, about uh, 200 miles or so roughly to our south and east. So that's where we find meteorologist Mike Bettis. And Mike, here the scene is uh, business as usual, but everyone's talking about Florence, trying to uh, welcome family and friends that they know along the coast, welcome them here to Charlotte. Um, what's the scene there? You mentioned there was only like one person at the beach as uh, Myrtle Beach under mandatory evacuation. Yeah. Yeah, mandatory evacuation here. Business is not as usual here, Chris. There's just, just a handful of people that we've seen this evening uh, down on the beach. And that's, I mean, the weather's nice this evening. All the lifeguards are bringing all the umbrellas, everything off the beach. The boardwalk's been cleared out, and it's it's really just a shell of what it normally would be here in Myrtle Beach, which is usually just a happening place. This is dinner time. There'd be a lot of people down here. Nothing's open. Everything is closed. Uh, here at the Oceanfront Bar and Grill, they were actually open for lunch this afternoon, but then they quickly packed everything in. They moved everything in. Even you'll notice here. They close the doors up and they put down some sandbags here to try to keep any water that may come up in uh, out of the restaurant. If we get significant surge, they mean a lot more than, than just those sandbags there. But we also know that we're going to have a lot of issues with rain, right? So let's talk a little bit more about that. The Weather Prediction Center has actually issued a three-day forecast for excessive rain and flash flooding, a high risk. And Greg Carbon from the Weather Prediction Center joining us now live. Uh, Greg, thanks for being with us. Uh, an exceptional forecast there, right? Uh, high risk for flash flooding and excessive rainfall. Give us your thinking behind the forecast here and what you would anticipate. So good to hear you, Mike, and uh, uh, good evening. This is only the second time that the uh, Weather Prediction Center has uh, pulled out all the stops on a 72-hour uh, forecast for excessive rainfall. Uh, typically, we would not uh, go to such a high level with this, uh, with this outlook, but uh, the last time was, unfortunately, Hurricane Harvey. So the confidence in an extreme rainfall event is very high at this point. It's a small area where that confidence is high. It's basically the uh, the coast of Southeast North Carolina as we see Florence come ashore during the day on Friday. Uh, extreme rainfall rates, two, three, five inches an hour, not out of the question. Uh, before all is said and done there, we're probably measuring rainfall in feet uh, across parts of Eastern North Carolina. Uh, hey, Greg, it's Dr. Rick Nabb. Uh, really appreciate all you uh, folks at WPC are doing to highlight the inland flood threat. Give us a little bit of background for those who are not familiar. What kind of outcomes you have seen in past days when you put the high risk out like this? 
So this this uh, motivates a lot of response uh, with respect to uh, uh, federal partners, uh, uh, FEMA, uh, and others involved in trying to get people out of harm's way. Basically, it's a it's a tool for messaging the extreme nature of this upcoming event, uh, and hopefully, we get people up off the uh, the lower elevations and into safe places away from the coast. It's not just as you know the the coastal flooding; it's the fresh water flooding from the extreme rainfall uh, that claims so many lives. The last time we saw this in this area of North Carolina, not very long ago, uh, with Hurricane Matthew. So we know what can come about from these systems. We've seen it before, not uh, not all that long ago. And uh, the key is to get up and on higher ground and away from those rivers and streams that are prone to uh, flooding. And once they flood, they're going to remain flooded for quite some time. So that's the other problem as well. Uh, a, a very significant event uh, coming up here. You know, Greg, you know, we've we've shown our viewers some of the tropical rainfall records, state records for North Carolina and South Carolina, anywhere between, say, 18 and 24 inches of rain. Do you think that state records could be threatened with this system? Uh, when I first started looking at this system, it reminded me a lot of Hurricane Floyd, which I believe was responsible for the 24-inch record uh, in North Carolina, Southport, North Carolina, very close to Wilmington. Uh, so I do believe that this has the potential to uh, to, to threaten that record. Uh, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> that's that's not an area that wants to see you know yeah. two feet of rain. Uh, but it certainly looks at this point in time that that will be the uh, the ground zero for some of the heaviest rainfall associated with Florence. Greater uncertainty as we get in and the storm slows down and it's tracked beyond uh, Friday. Uh, still a lot of uncertainty where this heavier rainfall will end up, but uh, increasing confidence in eastern North Carolina is really going to bear the brunt, at least initially, of the heaviest rainfall. Yeah. Very great stuff. Uh, Greg Carbon, thanks so much for all the information. Excellent, excellent stuff there. And as he said, a kind of a rare event for them to issue a high risk of three days in advance like that, but it shows you some confidence in what this system can do. Stick with us more on Category 4 Florence when we come back from Myrtle Beach. All right, welcome back to the Weather Channel's continuing live coverage of Hurricane Florence, a deadly monster. Today is a busy day here in Charlotte as we're starting to take in evacuees from the coast of South Carolina and North Carolina. And right now there are two things the city is talking about. Of course, Hurricane Florence and also remembering the fateful events that took place 17 years ago to this day. You can see the flags here on this somber September 11th. Of course, people paying their respects, but they're also vigilant as to what's to come over the next couple of days. This is something we have to watch very closely. And again, you may be wondering, oh, Charlotte's not gonna get much, right? Think again. I mean, yeah, we're not gonna be dealing with the storm surge and those catastrophic winds we're gonna be dealing with at the coast, but we are certainly gonna be seeing impacts from this. Now, some of the models are still trying to get the pieces put together. And as we get closer, we'll have a better idea, but do know Charlotte could potentially deal with over a half foot to a foot of rain and inland flooding is gonna be a big concern. From the coast, we're talking over 200 miles inland. If you're thinking about evacuating to Charlotte or some of the clo uh, closer cities to the coast, you might wanna think about going even further out of harm's way because it's gonna be a big concern here. And again, that inland flooding is gonna be a big risk. Some areas, while it may not be exactly over Charlotte, but some areas in the Carolinas, Dr. McNabb, are gonna get their fair share of rain on what's already been some of the wettest um, summers on record across North Carolina, including places like Wilmington, Asheville, North Carolina, and up into Virginia. Yeah, and Chris, every hazard that a hurricane can bring to bear is in play here, and all of them are potentially life-threatening if you don't take it seriously and get ready in advance of the storm and get ready for a long-duration event because of when it gets here, it's going to stick around for a while. Uh, the Category 4 hurricane, 140-mile-an-hour winds, is moving at 17 miles an hour now, and it's not going to slow down much until it arrives, and then it could meander near the coastline. Uh, you can't take to the bank the exact track and intensities here, but prepare for the landfall of a major hurricane, at least category three, and then it have, uh, you know, some opportunity to to uh, strengthen some more over water uh, beyond Thursday, even if uh, you know, this turns out to be exactly right. It might still be offshore uh, Thursday afternoon. And then even if it comes on shore, it could be under back offshore. There's so many things that could happen in here. Uh, 
but the bottom line with these uh, four forecast points is not much motion. And once the winds of tropical storm force start, they could last for a long, long time at the coast and inland. Same for the rain, same for the storm surge, and they're all life threatening. Hurricane warning from South Santee River, South Carolina, up to Duck, North Carolina, up in this area. And uh, you can see that the warnings go some distance inland as well. This is not just going to be a coastal wind event. This will be an inland wind event, cause some power outages. The storm surge warnings in the hot pink here uh, in the same area as the hurricane warning, and it's not just for the immediate beachfront. It goes includes the sounds of North Carolina and goes up rivers in both South and North Carolina. Uh, anything three feet or greater uh, storm surge is considered life threatening, and in the heart of it, uh, we could see uh, greater than six feet, maybe even greater than nine or 12 feet of storm surge flooding above normally dry ground in the coastal area. So you got to find out now if you're in an evacuation zone, decide now where you're going to go, how you're going to get there if you haven't left and you haven't been told to leave yet. Uh, consider your needs where you're going to be taking shelter uh, because you've got to be in a safe place that is safe from wind and is out of flood prone areas and, and in a place that can take care of whatever needs you have to get through uh, a long duration event, including if there's going to be a power outage. It, you might be able to be somebody's evacuation destination, but it, Bottom line, though, we're in storm surge warning time frame, so you've got to evacuate immediately if people tell you to go. And Mike Bettis, I, I, it sounds like a lot of people have heeded those evacuation instructions, but one thing about the Myrtle Beach area is that there's a lot of high rises, and I urge people not to evacuate by going up in their high rise and riding it out there. Stronger winds and you'd be uh, isolated in a coastal community. It could be flooded and without power for a long time without help. Well, I think that's why so many people are just plain leaving NAB, even if even if they might think that, you know, they're, they're safe from storm surge several stories up. But it's just going to be a tough situation with all the rain that could be coming and they're just going to be stranded here. Uh, and that's why we have the mandatory evacuations here. That's why I have the storm surge warnings. That's why I have the hurricane warnings. These are all places that could be hugely impacted. And obviously, Florence is grabbing all the headlines, rightfully so. Right, Dr. NAB with the category four bearing down on us. However, we can't take our eye off of other things in the tropics because there could be other risks to other coastlines. Yep, uh, Texas, Louisiana, the Eastern Caribbean, the Hawaiian Islands, all could be uh, affected by wind and water in the next few days. Look at all the activity. Let's focus on what's going on uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, where we have a 70% chance of a depression or storm forming in the next five days over the central to northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And even if this does not become a depression or storm, uh, it could dump tremendous amounts of rainfall. We've had a lot of depression ish kinds of systems affect Texas, and Louisiana already this year, and there's already the possibility of flash flooding Thursday, Thursday night into Friday morning in southeastern Texas. Uh, the other concern is Isaac, a strong tropical storm that will be moving westward toward the windward and leeward islands could be a strong tropical storm, could be a hurricane, at least a rainmaker. Wow, so much to talk about. You've got to stay with us. I'm going to show you where the storm surge could occur in Florence and who's going to get inland flooding and heavy rain. Stay with us. And right now here on the Weather Channel, we are tracking Hurricane Florence, a potentially destructive hurricane taking direct aim at the east coast of the United States. We've got you covered tonight in the Carolinas and Virginia in the crosshairs right now for this intense hurricane, a storm that could go down as one of the strongest hurricane strikes on record in this area. We are breaking down each and every threat, including a life-threatening wind and storm surge that's expected to landfall with significant wave damage and beach erosion and landfall just the beginning. Florence will produce heavy rain and potentially catastrophic inland flooding for days to come. Find out where more than two feet of rain is possible. And welcome in, everyone. I'm meteorologist Mike Best coming to you live from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We're bringing you team coverage tonight. Meteorologist Chris Bruin is live in Charlotte, North Carolina. We also have our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Nav, that's joining us this evening as well. I want to update you on what we know right now, because for a lot of you, this is a very impactful storm system, and we're really, really um, keeping you up to date on what's happening minute by minute. The president has approved disaster declaration, emergency declaration for Virginia, but that also clears the way for federal help in that state, as well as North and South Carolina. Their requests have also been approved. The mayor of Washington, D.C. has actually issued a state of emergency for the city there, and the tolls now suspended on the Chesapeake Express way for those that are evacuating and a lot of people are evacuating and rightfully so we've got a serious hurricane threat bearing down on North and South Carolina. Let's bring in our hurricane expert Dr. Rick Nab. Dr. Nab with that latest advisory wind speeds back up again. Let's talk about 
when this thing comes in and what we should be expecting, at least right here at the coastline. Well, right at the coastline, uh, you've got to be first and foremost evacuating for storm surge. The historically deadliest hurricane hazard of all the salt water being pushed ashore uh, and not just at the immediate beachfront of the Outer Banks or the Barrier Islands in, in South Carolina. Uh, you've got to consider uh, how far inland the storm surge can go in the sounds of North Carolina and up rivers. Uh, so evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. If you've been from storm surge, but then the other thing at the coast is it's going to be a long duration event. Once the winds start, they could last a long time because this is going to slow down when it gets to the coast. And of course, as we've been saying, wind and water are going to be a huge concern for a long time to come in inland areas. We're going to be dealing with Florence long after landfall occurs. It's a category four hurricane right now. Winds at 140 miles an hour. It's moving west northwest at 17, but it's not going to continue moving at that pretty brisk pace of uh, all the way through landfall and beyond. It's going to slow down once it gets to us. And this is a scary sight. I mean, it's it's awe inspiring on one hand. It's beautiful on one hand and it's ugly and scary and potentially could take your life if you don't take this seriously. So that's why we're here. We're going to paint the picture for what could happen and urge you to take the time between now and when the winds start increasing late tomorrow and early the next day. Uh, you got to get things done by then. So tonight and tomorrow are the times for preparation before Florence arrives. Expected to be a major hurricane at landfall, could even reach Cat 5 somewhere along the way. It probably doesn't reach the coast as Cat 5, but at least a major hurricane, at least three, maybe a four, and then it will slow down. Look at the cone uh, after it reaches the coastal area. Don't take this to the bank that it goes exactly this forward speed. It could meander near the coast, just offshore, uh, just inland, uh, and that's why it's going to be such a long duration event. As of 5 p.m. Eastern time, hurricane warnings are up uh, for Georgetown, South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, Charleston's uh, still in the uh, tropical storm warning hurricane. I'm sorry, in a hurricane watch. Hurricane warnings north of there, and it's for all of eastern North Carolina up to Duck. And look how far inland those wind warnings go. We have the possibility of sustained winds of tropical storm force arriving as soon as late tomorrow night or early Thursday. So that's why tomorrow you want to get done with all your preparations uh, pretty much by the time the sun goes down because all the things you need to do evacuate, put up shutters, plywood, uh, get your supplies, get into your shelter for the storm for the duration. You got to do that by tomorrow night. Sustained winds of tropical storm force could go way inland. That's why there's going to be a, a power outage problem. And once these winds start, they could last a long time. Hurricane force winds could even go far inland. And the storm surge warning is also up as of 5 p.m. Same stretch of coastline as the hurricane warning, including where you are, Mike Bettis and Myrtle Beach. But notice that up rivers and in the sounds up in North Carolina, they've got the storm surge warning as well. You don't have to be someone with beachfront property and see the ocean from where you live for the ocean to come see you. Got to evacuate. A lot of things can go wrong when the, when the ocean gets angry, that's for sure, Dr. Nab. Thank you very much. Well, we know that we have some very pristine coastline here in South Carolina, but also some very vulnerable coastline. Let's talk right now to Brenda Bethune, the mayor of Myrtle Beach. Mayor, thanks for being with us. Obviously, you're probably watching the updates like we are, you know, hour by hour here. Uh, what's the status of the city right now, and what do you want to tell your residents? The city is ready. We are continuing to make sure that we have construction sites secured, Anything that could turn into a flying object off of the streets, police are patrolling the area, particularly answering, answering questions and trying to direct people who are trying to evacuate. And that is the one thing we're trying to stress. It seems like um, from what we've been able to tell, evacuation's gone pretty smoothly. There are not a lot of people here anymore. No, there aren't. And we've had to evacuate over a million people on roads that really are not designed for that many people. And we don't have an interstate. So that is why it is so important for people to leave and leave early. Plus, we will not have the emergency personnel in place to help people if they stay during the storm. This could go on for days. Uh, we know it may be a long duration event and flooding could then become an issue as well. How is the county and the city prepared to deal with that threat as well? We are very prepared. We're working together. We have been coordinating with, e with each other all week as well as with the state. So I think that we are on I think everyone is ready. We are just enjoying the calm before the storm, so to say. 
and just trying to get some rest before everything gets a little hairy. When it comes to the folks that, that are going to remain, and, and some will that are not necessarily in an evacuation, Myrtle Beach is in an evacuation mode, but some places in Horry County are not under evacuation orders. For those that stay, what would you be your, your, your advice to them? Make sure you're prepared. Let people know where you are. That is so important in an emergency situation like this. This storm is massive, and we will have significant impacts from it. So have your food, your water, your medications. Let people know where you are. Batteries, flashlights, and stay inside. Mayor, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You. Best of luck. It's a beautiful place. We that way, that is for sure. But we know there could be a lot of issues here uh, in the Grand Strand when it comes to three major threats from this hurricane. Storm surge, wind, and freshwater flooding falling from those clouds, right? That's going to be a really, really big ongoing issue, even after the winds start to wind down once we maybe get some interaction with land, right? So those are all things we have to take uh, into consideration through the duration of this storm. And again, it's not going to be, it comes in, it makes landfall, and then dissipates, and it's gone. It's not going to be like that at all. In some regards, it's going to have aspects of a Hurricane Harvey. Now, we're not forecasting necessarily Hurricane Harvey rain, but it's kind of the same MO, if you will. Come ashore potentially as a major landfalling hurricane that stick around producing a lot of rain. And those are going to be big issues for us here in eastern, in, um, in eastern North Carolina especially, and then through the Grand Strand and down through uh, maybe even the Midlands and, and down through the Low Country. Uh, but this is why we have uh, all, all the schools and offices that are closed uh, basically across the state of South Carolina, the coastal counties, all the zones A, B, and C are under mandatory evacuations with these storm surge warnings, with the hurricane warnings now in effect. And by the way, Horry County, which is where we are, they've ordered ordered in that they've asked for uh, additional EMS that's coming. They've asked for additional fire, which is coming. They've asked for additional high water rescue, which is coming. Those are all good things. So, so first responders are coming, but they did say this. Once the winds get to 60 miles per hour, they will no longer respond to emergency calls. Okay, and that's an important thing, Dr. Nav. 60 miles an hour is going to be their threshold. So if you're in trouble, you should have evacuated, but, but don't count on someone coming to help you out. Yeah, and Mike, there's another aspect of that, and that is what if you are in an area that experiences storm surge, your particular structure doesn't flood, but the community is flooded and powers out, you're going to be isolated. So don't try to find a way like by vertically evacuating in a high rise or, or, or any other method of doing anything but evacuating the communities that are told to evacuate because there are so many ways that you could be in trouble after the storm arrives where storm surge and winds uh, could occur. And the storm surge warning includes where Mike is in Myrtle Beach. It's down to Georgetown, uh, South Carolina. And then look at all this area in North Carolina under the storm surge warning, including the sounds. So this is just a, a big picture of how high the water could get in some of these areas, as high as uh, 12 feet uh, in portions of the North Carolina coast. Not everybody's going to get everything you see here, but this is what is possible. And I wanted to show you the potential storm surge flooding map from the National Hurricane Center. It takes into account all kinds of different track intensity and size scenarios to show you where the hot spots are. And look at the eastern North Carolina area. It's not just the outer banks of North Carolina that could flood due to storm surge. Look at all these areas. Now, some of this is intertidal zones and marshy. It's not normally dry ground, but a lot of it is in places like Elizabeth City. You could flood due to storm surge in a particular scenario. Uh, if you are in New Bern, North Carolina, look how far from the beaches of the Outer Banks you are. You could get storm surge coming through the sounds and up the rivers. Up the river in Wilmington could also bring storm surge your way. So don't pay attention to any forecast you see on the web or wherever that's for storm surge based on one exact track that is not a reliable way to take this uh, seriously Mike because just a few miles difference in the ultimate track mm -hmm. could mean life or death for somebody who didn't evacuate got to get out yeah Oh, it definitely could, Dr. Nab. It's great advice for sure. Uh, terrific advice. And a lot of people are getting out. So many people have evacuated here and a lot of people that we talked to today Chris Bruin where were they evacuating to Charlotte North mm -hmm. Carolina where you are so I anticipate a big influx yeah. there into the Queen City of people that are leaving the coast. 
Oh yeah, we're already seeing that and we're already getting that uh, from reports of hotel rooms starting to fill up here pretty quickly across the Queen City of Charlotte and even points further west. We're talking Greenville, uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, another spot that a lot of people are thinking about evacuating to and even Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and you may even want to consider going even further than that. So it's something uh, to keep in mind because just because you evacuate to Charlotte doesn't mean you're out of harm's way. We're going to have inland flooding and that's going to be a big concern. One thing I do want to touch on very briefly as a lot of coastal uh, pet shelters uh, near the coast like Charleston up towards Myrtle Beach where Mike is at are evacuating their pet shelters and they're sending their pets up this way to shelters that can hold them. So it's something to think about. I know some um, of the shelters were waiving some of the adoption fees further south into coastal South Carolina, even coastal North Carolina. And then the ones that um, don't get uh, adopted will have to be transfer, uh, transferred uh, to a safer location because, again, those uh, um, humane societies and animal near the coast, they have to think about preparations as well. So a lot of them have uh, moved further north. In fact, I know uh, some of the pet shelters in and around the Charlotte area have taken in a lot of uh, pets from areas further south. We even talked to a couple of people who just adopted a couple of days ago. So a lot of people walking their dogs. Don't forget about your pets either, folks. Again, you want to make sure they have a plan with you. They're part of your family. Keep them safe. Don't leave them at home. Make sure you have a plan in place. Let's talk about inland flooding because it is going to be serious. Now, in Charlotte, we could have the potential to see 6 to 12 inches of rain. We could also see maybe a few inches. It, it depends on the exact track. And again, that's something that we still have to uh, fine tune the details as we get closer. But do know that possibility is there. This is going to be a slow mover and is pretty much going to creep along once it makes landfall and push further inland towards uh, northern South Carolina and here into the Charlotte metro area. So rainfall is going to be a big concern and when you have super saturated ground, you could be dealing with power outages even in winds only up to 30 40 miles per hour. How much rain are we expecting? And again, timing on this, the rain likely to push in late Friday afternoon, Friday night, and then really going into Saturday, Sunday and even lingering into Monday. Those QPFs are just astonishing. Dr. Nab, and again, inland flooding is going to be a big risk. While we may not see 60 inches of rain like we saw in Harvey, 20 inches of rain here in this part of the country could do just as much of a damaging results, especially given the fact that we've had such a wet summer. Yeah, it, when you consider that just a few to several inches of rain can easily cause flash flooding in this event, when we're talking double digits and maybe feet of rain and not just inches, you could understand why we're talking about the potential for a catastrophic inland flood event at some point somewhere because of this slow motion of the hurricane after it reaches the coast. And you don't know exactly what kind of motion is going to happen here. We just know it's going to be slow in this general area. And who gets the worst rain is very track dependent. And it's also so beyond the five day time frame, it might take quite a while for the system to get out of here over the next 10 days or out to 10 days. Not every alternative scenario from the European model has it out of here. So this could be a very long duration rainfall event. And already the Weather Prediction Center is taking the extraordinary step. Maybe only once before have they ever done this to three days in advance call for uh, a high likelihood of flash flooding that could be damaging and deadly in the area of eastern North Carolina, but flash flooding extending beyond that area. And look at the area that could, could in some spots get 10 to 20 inches isolated up to 30. Just astonishing. And flooding potential goes on beyond that. Locations of greatest rainfall depend on the exact track. Catastrophic flooding is expected in some locations. Some areas could flood with just a few inches of rain like Virginia. And then flooding from rivers could occur long after the rainfall stops. Let's take a look at another area of the country that has already been getting some heavy rainfall in recent days. And unfortunately for them, more is on the way as well as tropical moisture will stay in place and then be reinforced as our invest 95 L a, a, a tropical wave interacting with an upper level trough moves into the Gulf of Mexico. This has a high chance of becoming a depression or storm over the central or northwestern Gulf. But after that, how much rain we could get in southeastern and deep south Texas. This could cause flash flooding. And Mike, you, you probably remember what happened in Brownsville, Texas, deep south Texas a couple months ago. It wasn't even a depression, so concerns yeah. there as well. Yeah, and now we've got a category four bearing down on us, right? And so a major landfalling hurricane with rainfall rates that the 
Weather Prediction Center is predicting potentially as much as five inches an hour. So the question is, why is there now a statewide burn ban in South Carolina? We'll have that answer for you coming up next. And welcome back everyone to our ongoing coverage of Hurricane Florence. I'm meteorologist Mike Bettis. Listen, we've got a 140 mile per hour hurricane that's bearing down on the Carolinas right now. And it means a lot of impacts along the coast, but also well inland. And we think that a flooding is going to be a very big issue because we could be looking at feet of rain before all is said and done with this system. OK, and it's only the second time that the Weather Prediction Center has issued a three day outlook with a high risk. OK, the only other time they did it, this gives you perspective, Hurricane Harvey. So that means we are going to see potentially record setting rainfall here in North and South Carolina. All right, so we take a look at some of the records that we've seen. We to go back in the history books, okay? Harvey, the biggest tropical rainmaker we've ever seen in U.S. history, 60 inches of rain, right? But then you look at what the state records are for North and South Carolina from tropical landfalling system. How about Floyd back in 1999? What's well, a slow moving system, produced a ton of rain, 24 inches, the state record in North Carolina. And then it was Jerry in 95 in South Carolina, produced 18 and a half inches of rain. Those records could be rivaled if so then begs the question, why is there a statewide burn ban in South Carolina if that much rain is coming our way? Well, it's not because there's an elevated risk for fire danger. It's because they're deploying so many firefighters from other regions of the state down toward the areas that could be highly impacted that there may not be enough firefighters to respond to fires in other parts of the state. That's why they're issuing the statewide Burn ban. Amazing that that's the reason that they're doing it, but it makes perfect sense, right? Well, it's South Carolina, obviously not the only place going to be impacted. We think a heavy blow could come to North Carolina as well. Let's head to Carolina Beach, North Carolina. NBC's Jay Gray is there. Jay, a place uh, we think now with the current track, incredibly susceptible to high wind and storm surge. Yeah. Yeah, no, Mike, you're absolutely right. And people preparing for that as best they can. Most of the boats that were in this marina gone at this point. The charters you see are locked down. There's a mandatory evacuation here and really uh, most everywhere along the coast from Virginia through the Carolinas right now. They're trying to clear out this island before Florence moves in. It's moving day across the southeast. It's important for us to evacuate. We don't need to take chances. Even the Navy shipping out ahead of the storm. We are in a, a very deadly and important game of chess with Hurricane Florence. The next move for more than a million along the coast is to higher ground. For us, we've never been through one. We don't have a clue what's, what to do or what you know where to go. Officials warning, even those who've been through storms before, this one is different. This storm is a monster. Don't bet your life on riding out a monster. Alora Burton is securing everything she can before she leaves. I have a second story, so I took all the electronics upstairs, the TV and everything. On the first floor, the furniture is raised and stacked, guarding against a potential storm surge. Hurricane Florence is, is the strongest storm to uh, target the Carolinas in this part of our country in decades. Still, there are some who plan to ride it out. We're ready. We're ready every year. And, uh, you know, if it's your time, it's your time. The time to prepare leaving or staying is running out across the strike zone. Yeah, you know, it really is that window closing, and it's going to close pretty fast starting tomorrow, right, Mike? I mean, we're going to see some of the conditions start to ramp up uh, late tomorrow, then getting into Thursday and Friday. If you haven't got your plan in place, it's pretty much, I would think, going to be too late. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, you know, you've got some time tomorrow, but not much, and then conditions are going to go downhill yeah. and go downhill fairly quickly and stick around for a while, too. Jay, thank you so much for the report live from Carolina Beach. All right, let's bring in our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Nab. Dr. Nab, uh, amazing to think about Florence and its scope of what may happen here, but at the same time, we've got Olivia that we've got to watch over in Hawaii, too. Yeah, and the conditions are going to be going downhill this evening and later tonight in the Hawaiian Islands as Olivia although weakening is still going to bring the possibility of strong and damaging winds that could cause power outages and some heavy rains uh, that could cause flash flooding and mudslides. Uh, this is 
Olivia, now it doesn't look like that much on the infrared as it approaches the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, from the east, an unusual direction to get a tropical storm to last long enough. And you might be looking at this going, oh, that's falling apart, but that exposed low level swirl still has a lot of wind in it. Okay, this is still a strong tropical storm and there's still uh, a lot of uh, heavy rainfall, especially on the east side. But remember, when a tropical storm even that looks like this interacts with the complex terrain of the Hawaiian Islands, you can really enhance the wind speeds and enhance the rainfall and then after it falls in that complex terrain you can get tremendous amounts of flooding so uh, as it passes over the islands this could be worse for a lot of the islands than lane was because even though it's weaker it's passing directly over the island chain so don't uh, think that this is less of a threat than lane for where you live uh, when you compare it to lane because this is going directly overhead and when those winds uh, interact with the terrain you could get not only sustained tropical storm force winds that cause damage and power outages but also hurricane force gusts and look at how much rain could fall up to a foot or more in isolated spots so a very dangerous night ahead lasting into tomorrow and when we come back we're going to get back to florence and how much time do we have left to prepare how who needs to evacuate and what about those inland floods? How long could they last? Stay with us here on the Weather Channel. We are planning for a hard impact of a Category 4 storm. Hurricane Florence is a, a very dangerous storm. A prolonged period of major to record flooding is likely well inland from Florence's rainfall. Over a million citizens currently under mandatory evacuation. Heed the local and state warning. Hurricane Florence, a major hurricane taking aim at the Carolinas tonight and a lot of worry along the coastline and even inland of what this hurricane could do. It could absolutely destroy cities like Myrtle Beach. If a right front quadrant hit comes here, it could wipe out this boardwalk and flood many blocks inland. This is a really serious threat, folks, and we hope you take it seriously. We want to update you on what we know right now, okay, because uh, as of right now in South Carolina, they've deployed 800 National Guardmen to uh, assist with Florence. In Charleston, South Carolina, evacuation shelters there, as we now know, are not built to withstand Category 3 or higher winds, so what the county is doing now is they're preparing to bus evacuate people to other counties that may not be directly hit so they can shelter people uh, properly and safely. Duke Energy power outages because of the significance of the wind that we'll see with Florence and asking people to be prepared to be without power for days, potentially I would say even weeks. Facebook is now activating its community help feature to help in recovery needs. So a lot of things happening, a lot of things, uh, a lot of wheels spinning right now to, to keep everything and everyone safe. In, the, in light of what's coming our way here. But we know that uh, that's happening at the local level, the state level, and at the national level as well. Today, President Trump addressing what the national government is doing to assist with Hurricane Florence. Any amounts of money, whatever it takes, we're going to do. But we're already set up. We have tremendous trucking systems. We have food systems. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of contractors waiting. But for the most part, it's been handled by FEMA. And also, we've coordinated locally. Federal, state, and local governments, hopefully all on the same page here. And I, and I will say this, a, a lot of people have left and left early. And I think that's a really good thing because in that way, when the event comes and the event unfolds, everyone's ready to do their thing, okay? And first responders and emergency workers can do what they need to do. Now, Myrtle Beach, now kind of give you the lay of the land, okay? We're standing up here in the boardwalk, newly refurbished not that long ago, a couple years ago. Beach is right here. Right, folks? So there's, there's not a lot of space between the beach, the boardwalk, and the businesses. And imagine, you know, with an angry Atlantic Ocean coming your way, what kind of storm surge could be produced if you're on a right front quadrant? Again, the, the location of landfall is not exactly known right now, okay? We're two days away from a landfall. Could it be in North Carolina? Yes. Could it be in South Carolina? Possible. Okay, so this is why we need to pay attention to the forecast closely. Every few hours. Be checking in with us so you can stay up to date and know what to do, what's best for you and your family to keep them safe. Now, as far as the weather goes today, I mean, um, pretty decent skies. Been fair weather skies today, a little breezy down here at the water's edge, but it was a humid, hot, humid day this afternoon. People that were doing prep work today, putting up 
uh, boards, putting up the hurricane shutters, sandbagging. It was tough work today. They were sweating out for sure. So I would recommend this, folks, if you're still doing maybe a little bit of work tomorrow before you decide to evacuate, hydration, 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 okay? Don't, don't, don't exhaust yourself here, Dr. Nab, before the event even gets here because it's gonna be exhausting in and of itself. So be smart ahead of the storm as well. Absolutely, and the, the, the time to prepare is so valuable because it can make a lot of difference to how it goes during the storm and afterward. And you got to be thinking about where you're going to take shelter. We're talking about a major hurricane coming ashore, category three or stronger. That brings the storm surge. We're going to have the inland wind uh, and uh, water problems. But as a major hurricane comes ashore, in many ways, you're talking about tornado type winds, okay? And realize that when you're forecasting, say, a category three or four coming ashore, you could have stronger winds if you go a higher up. So, you know, winds at the 25th floor of a coastal high rise are about a category stronger than what you get at the surface. So let's say it makes it all the way to the coast as category four. That means if you go up to the 25th floor, you could get category five strength winds. Uh, flying debris from nearby buildings uh, could pose a very dangerous threat. And it's so important in Myrtle Beach and, and surrounding areas not to uh, vertically evacuate uh, from uh, the storm surge. You need to get out of that community so that you can uh, you know, not find yourself in an isolated location. Okay, so where we see the, the winds being the big problem are not just at the coast, but potentially going inland as well. And that's why there could be power outages and you've got to uh, be thinking about what you need in order to get through uh, a power outage, whether it's tropical storm force winds or hurricane force winds. Uh, Chris Bruin, you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that is one place that could get tropical storm force winds maybe hurricane force winds and gusts and uh, that could be power outages and all kinds of inland flooding. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dr. Nab. especially when it comes to the rainfall. We've got big issues here, even this far away from the coast. We're going to talk about what it means for college football games, pro sports games and for evacuees that are headed to Charlotte. We're going to have more details coming up. Time is running out in the coastal areas of North and South Carolina to get ready for the arrival of Hurricane Florence. And its arrival is going to be a process. It's going to be slowing down as it approaches the coastline. It is a category three hurricane, but my goodness, it's a big one. Uh, very large in size. And I don't want you to be breathing this huge sigh of relief uh, because of the uh, weaker winds, because we're very, very concerned about what a large hurricane can do. Uh, and I'll ask one of my weather producers to see if they can uh, uh, extricate me from what I've done and pressing the wrong button to get this thing to move. Uh, but Florence is a large hurricane. Tropical storm force winds extend outward almost 200 miles from the center of circulation. And a larger hurricane is far more capable of producing a devastating storm surge, having long duration and long duration of rainfall. And as it comes ashore, eventually, it will mean a lot of you are gonna have to deal with the storm for days, maybe not just in hours. And as we take a look at what time you have left to get ready, because it's so large, once the winds uh, arrive, it might be quite a while until the core gets there, but tonight's the time to get ready because by tomorrow morning, maybe early tomorrow morning, we could be experiencing those winds of tropical storm force. A devastating storm surge will accompany it and very catastrophic rainfall induced flash flooding and potentially long duration wind event. Be safe in the power outage and stay out of the water, whether it's salt water, fresh water, or both. The Hurricane Hunters have been providing such valuable data, and our Dave Malkoff went along with the Hunters into Florence. Watch this. It's just about 20 minutes before 3 a.m., and we are getting on the Hurricane Hunter, taking our seat on a mission right into the hurricane. The surface is starting to climb up here. Looks like we're going right towards it, but ahead in. 
and exit out the southwest side. From our takeoff off the coast of Savannah, Georgia, it will take us more than three and a half hours to make it to the churning storm, more than 1,100 miles at sea. That's an impressive southeast quadrant. Yeah. 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 The Air Force Reserve 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron from the 403rd Wing have equipped this WC-130J to hunt hurricanes. One minute to the bumps. It gets quite bumpy as we approach the inner bands near Florence's eye wall. Pretty cool looking eye. We are rocking and rolling in the turbulence, dipping like a roller coaster because we are not flying around or over this hurricane. We are flying right through it at about 10,000 feet. We're all safe up here, but look down that tube. That is a hole in the plane dropping 10,000 feet down to the Atlantic below. Good drop there. Proud of you. Thanks, man. This is an example of an RD-94 GPS drop zone. It is literally a probe that will go into that tube, shoot out the bottom of the plane into the hurricane. A parachute pops out the black top part, and it sends its data right back to the engineers on board. Our load, we're going to go ahead and uh, do an eyewall drop here. It's reporting back to the plane of, uh, three times a uh, second. Dang, this is a huge eye. Uh... We watch the data pour in, but they're also receiving via satellite in Miami at the National Hurricane Center updating the path of the storm. Is there any other way to get this type of information, like from a satellite or from radar? Absolutely not. Uh, satellites are great, obviously, but we can actually go in kind of a three-dimensional view of what's going on in the storm. At the same time, there's a fairly new technology back here. This is a bathy thermograph. It'll follow the back of the plane out of that launch tube and hit the ocean surface and deploy a probe. And it measures ocean temperature, how hot the ocean is, how much energy is available for the hurricane. That's right. Nav, Navy, buoy with. The Navy and Coast Guard watch the temperature come in. Look at that sea surface. It is over 80 degrees. That's as hot as a swimming pool. Wow, it just opened up here. You can see the entire sky now. As our mission ends, we get a surprise. The storm has replaced its eye and given us a show. So we're in the eye now. Yes, we are. Welcome to the eye. Got the eye. We're going to start turning here pretty soon. Okay. Roger. Winds are falling. Let off, please. Let me show you something in here. We can actually see the blue sky. That's because we're inside the eye of Hurricane Florence. Sunshiny, beautiful weather. Nothing in here for about 30 miles. You see the sky because the atmosphere is literally trying to balance chaos with calm. The most violent sections of the storm are spinning out, and the calm center is all that's left. Like a planetary merry-go-round, the outside horses are the fastest ones. And in the center, you're barely moving at all. Science. How do you like doing this? I love it. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a dream job. Uh, growing up, I'd always kind of thought about doing this. I absolutely love it. From inside the eye of the storm, Dave Malkoff, The Weather Channel. All right, well, that's a wrap for our teams tonight. But, Mike, I know Wilmington and Myrtle Beach are going to look much different this time tomorrow. Indeed they are, Alex. For all of us here, uh, we appreciate you watching tonight. We've got another crew on deck to get you through Florence tonight. Carl Parker, Maria La Rosa, Chris Warren, and Dave Malkoff. Have a safe night, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow. There's not much of a mood in town. Everybody's pretty much headed out. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of residents headed out. I've been through a lot of storms in my life, and this uh, seems to have people a little bit more on edge than usual. Time is just about out to get out. Tracking Florence here on the Weather Channel. This a Category 3 storm, a major hurricane moving to the northwest, still moving toward the United States with winds at 115 miles an hour. It is dark now, but when that sun comes up tomorrow, it is going to be a different deal along the Carolinas. We're really going to start to feel the impacts of Hurricane Florence. You're watching the Weather Channel, and we have team coverage here.
tracking this storm minute by minute with the very latest information. I'm meteorologist Chris Warren in North Carolina. We also have Dave Malkoff who flew with the hurricane hunters today. The valuable information they gather and what it's like to be in the air flying through a hurricane. Also, storm specialist Carl Parker and of course Maria La Rosa joining us from the Weather Channel. Comprehensive coverage you're only going to find here on the Weather at Channel as we track this massive and extensive storm. So with this storm, as we are tracking it, uh, I am here again, not too far away from the Outer Banks of North Carolina here uh, near uh, Moorhead City and Beaufort, North Carolina, about in between here. We're near the water in what we believe is a safe location. We are expecting to see some surge. Some of the water behind me is expected to rise. We do think again we are in a safe location to bring you the very latest uh, of this storm as it is happening. And this storm, a little bit more than 150 uh, miles away, at least some of the outer rain bands here. The center of it, though, much farther away. And by tomorrow morning, sun up where we are right here, we can see that forecast does bring that storm very close uh, to the shoreline. Closer and closer to the United States, we're expecting to see some of those tropical storm force winds. Again, here in Moorhead City, uh, we are seeing some of the first looks of this storm just more than 150 miles away. We're starting to see a little bit of green showing up on the radar. So with that, the states most likely to be impacted, both the Carolinas, Virginia and down to Georgia. All of these areas do have the potential of seeing some impacts in the next couple of days where it goes after that. That is still a big question, but we did hear from North Carolina Governor uh, Roy Cooper a little bit earlier just how serious of a situation we're dealing with. We're telling people who are ignoring evacuation orders that not only are you putting your own life at risk, you're putting the lives of first responders at risk, and that's not right. So we're getting a positive response, I think, on these evacuation orders, and I know local authorities are working to make sure specific areas that we know may be flooded are evacuated as well. And here in Moorhead City, North Carolina, the curfew goes into effect mid morning. First thing, though, the curfew for Atlantic Beach, which is one of the barrier islands just offshore of Moorhead City, that goes into effect at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. So basically, people can still get off the island, but they're not going to let anybody back on. So when you, you look at some of the potential impacts with this, power outages is going to be likely widespread. And if it's not the initial winds, the, the consistency and the persistence of these winds likely going to compromise some of the trees. Soils already saturated, and if they're not now, they will be. Extensive rainfall expected. And as we also think about the, the coastal areas, by next weekend, or by through the weekend, by next week, some of these coastlines, frankly, are just going to look different. Whether it's beach erosion, which is uh, pretty much a guarantee with this storm, and what we hope is not going to happen, but which is, which is possible, is the potential for destruction of some structures, some homes, some summer homes, uh, possible right at the immediate coast. Uh, and this is a, a very serious a situation that the National Hurricane Center has been uh, putting out some very strong wording now for days on this. Maria, when we look at this, once this storm is in full swing afterwards, we're talking about the potential for destruction of structures, life threatening situation, a potential catastrophic impacts when it comes to the flooding as well. Absolutely. All those things yet to happen, but already a lot of people are thinking about the aftermath. So let's get you caught up on what we know right now. More than 40,000 power and utility workers from 17 states ready to respond to Hurricane Florence. Charleston Airport closes just before midnight tonight and will remain closed at least through Friday. Fayetteville, Jacksonville and Wilmington, North Carolina airports also closed tonight. Delta Airlines added 1,200 seats with extra flights and upsized aircraft today, but has canceled about 80 flights, mostly scheduled for Thursday. So those are a few of the highlights right now of the details that we're following. And of course, I want to bring in Carl Parker, uh, taking a look at that satellite and already watching that radar and starting to see the outer rain bands.
Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I think it's tempting to believe that now that the intensity has come down a little bit, we're looking at less of a threat from this storm. I believe that would be a mistake to look at the storm this way. I'm seeing some chatter like that already on social media. And the storm, yes, is a little weaker than it has been. So the high end wind threat has come down somewhat. But this is a very large storm and it's a large storm that's going to slow down considerably and move very slowly along the coast or just inland over the course of two to three days. That is going to maximize all of the impacts that we're looking at. We're going to have a very long duration wind event, a very long duration surge event and a high potential for surge because the circulation, the wind field is so large and the rainfall could be catastrophic from this system, especially in the eastern part of North Carolina and South Carolina. So do not think do not think that because the winds have come down a bit that suddenly things are much better and we don't have so much to worry about. I would not say that at all. We've got huge concerns with this storm. It's now moving northwest at 16 miles per hour, category three storm. We're seeing some changes in terms of the internal structure. It's not quite as well formed as it has been, but it's still a very large see some intensification before it comes on shore. These are the forecast numbers intensities from the five o'clock advisory. We'll see if there's a little bit of revision coming up in the 11 o'clock advisory. But the, the main idea here is intact. And this is what we talked about yesterday. The models have really settled in on this idea of the storm drifting to the west and maybe west southwest and down and along the coast. And so all of the things that begin to set up late tomorrow continue through the day on Friday and continue into Saturday as well. That long duration is going to have a huge role to play in terms of how much in, uh, in the way of problems that we get from the storm. Look at the rainfall potential. That could be some of the highest rainfall amounts that we've seen there in that region. And here you see the timing of the tropical storm force winds. They begin to come in overnight tonight, starting to spread into the sounds and the outer banks by tomorrow morning. Here's a, a model forecast showing you the core of the storm beginning to reach the coastline by tomorrow evening. So that's six o'clock in the evening. The winds really stepping up at that time. The surge potential really stepping up at that time. And then we go into Friday morning, just about 12 hours later. You've still got this onshore flow there in the southern part of the sounds and into the outer banks. And then we go into Friday evening and you've still got that there because the storm has moved so little. So so Chris, this is what's really got me concerned at this point. The fact that the storm is going to go on for such a long time. Uh, yes, is it helpful that you know the winds come down a little bit? Sure, that's helpful. But you're talking about such a large storm that's going to do so many things and these things are going to last over the space of, of several days. And that's really what's worrying about the storm. And Carl, something else that, that you just mentioned, I think it's uh, worth highlighting here is the fact you said more rainfall than some of these areas have seen. And that's significant, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, when you look at historical storms, uh, we've had as much as 25 inches there into North Carolina, but in the case of this storm, we could be talking about 40 inches of rainfall in total. This is looking at the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. Again, they're showing you the slow motion of the system. So there we go into uh, tomorrow afternoon and evening, and then we take it into Friday. You see a little, that area of very deep tropical moisture has moved. Then we go into Saturday, just a little bit of motion off to the southwest and then into Sunday as well, uh, just a little bit of motion there and finally makes a little more of a westward uh, motion into Sunday and Monday, late Sunday and Monday. So uh, looking at the European model, uh, total precipitation, this is going through Tuesday, you've got an enormous area here uh, looking at double digit rainfall. And when you think about what happened with Hurricane Matthew, you know, we had catastrophic flooding inland in Lumberton, for example, in North Carolina, they got about 10 inches of rain and here we're talking about 18 to 24 inches and some spots getting 24 to 30 inches and maybe as much as 40 inches of rain in some areas. So we're looking at catastrophic flooding being likely there in the eastern part of North Carolina. 
uh, northeastern parts of South Carolina and then possible in a larger area that does extend across that 95 corridor and as far inland as Columbia as well. So really tremendous flash flooding and not just flash flooding, but also significant river flooding that's going to extend even farther inland across much of North and South Carolina. So, you know, Chris, this has got us very, very concerned. We've seen this again and again and again. You go back to Harvey, you know, Harvey was not a strong storm by the time it made it up to Houston. It was very strong when it came to South Texas, but it was only a tropical storm in the Houston area. And, you know, it doesn't take a real strong storm. What it takes is a storm that's not moving very much. And that's what we're going to see in this case. And that's why there's so much worry about flash flooding, Chris. And Carl, and I was thinking about that when you were showing how much rain is expected and how far inland it is and driving around when I, when I see these homes that are that are empty now and few cars around, very few people uh, around uh, Moorhead City, North Carolina. I'm wondering when I look at those maps of just how much rain is coming, I'm wondering where all those people are and and I'm hoping that yes, they got away from the storm surge. But hopefully, Carl, they are in a, a safe place where flooding in the inland areas is not going to be a concern. Yeah, I mean, that's a, definitely a big worry. Uh, that's precisely what we saw in the case of Hurricane Matthew. There were people that we, you know, we were actually on the air live while people were being rescued from a hotel. They had been in a hotel where flooding was occurring. And uh, Jim Cantori was live on the scene as they were pulling people out they were there or how they got there and there were a number of people that said that they actually had moved off the coast they had done exactly what they were told and gotten off the coast and moved inland by a hundred miles but then they moved to an area where there was significant flooding so so yes that's a, a really important question and if you're going to be moving off the coast there you might want to think about where you're going to go now it appears that there's going to be less of a threat as you move north more towards northern north carolina and more towards virginia and certainly a very significant threat well inland in South Carolina. And you also can think about, Chris, you know, where you are in terms of where you're staying. If, are you staying in a hotel that's near a creek or a river, or is it in a low-lying area? Uh, that might be hard to figure out in, on short notice, but at least it's something you can be thinking about as you, as you go to evacuate. Chris, over to you. Very good, Carl. Thank you so much uh, for that. And what we can do here at the Weather Channel is do our best to bring you the very latest information about where we think the worst is going to be. And part of that information is gathering what's happening now with the storm. And for that, we rely on the Hurricane Hunters. And Dave Malkoff did have a chance to fly with the Hurricane Hunters. Let's go to Dave right now live in Charleston, South Carolina. Dave, uh, what an amazing thing that they do and such an important thing that they do. It's, it's, it really is incredible to go out there into the storm. You're not flying above or around the storm. You're flying into the storm. You ever wonder where all that data comes from? How do they know what's going on with the storm? When it's way out there at sea, there's no radar there. There's no satellite that can penetrate all the way through the hurricane itself. You have to actually get in a WC-130J equipped with all sorts of equipment and probes that can shoot out the bottom and fly into the storm. Take a look at this. We're hunting for the exact center of rotation. So pilots, we can see the wind arrow here. We're looking for that to slowly tick down to almost zero. Then it'll flop directions once we go through the uh, exact center. We try to get them in the max wind bands of the eye wall. We try to get the strongest uh, winds we can on the surface. And then we always drop at the center of the storm to, to get the lowest pressure. So we're in the eye now? Yes, we are. Welcome to the eye. Got the eye. We're going to start turning here pretty soon. Okay. Gotcha. Winds are falling. Let off, please. Let me show you something in here. We can actually see the blue sky. That's because we we're inside the eye of Hurricane Florence. Sunshiny, beautiful weather. Nothing in here for about 30 miles. Get out your phone, scan the screen, and we will take you to some unique coverage that you will see nowhere else. We have a 360 virtual reality camera in the flight deck of that WC-130J run by the U.S. Air Force Reserve in their Hurricane Hunter aircraft. And we will take you there, Carl, 
it's an amazing experience, but you won't get the kind of bumpy, bumpy situation that I had. My head was spinning for hours after that. All right, Dave, thank you so much. And let, let's talk a little bit about the surge threat from this storm, which is really going to be significant. You've got a very large circulation, and that energy does not spin down quickly at all. Even if the, uh, the highest winds come down, you've still got a large circulation that's not going away anytime soon. And so as that comes up to the coast and then slowly moves down and along the coast, we are still looking for uh, tremendous surge values there in parts of North Carolina in particular, 9 to 13 feet. That is life threatening storm surge from the southern part of the Outer Banks uh, right down the coast into Moorhead City and into Myrtle Beach. Much more coming up. Three quarters of a million to one million North Carolinians have been asked to evacuate. If you aren't under evacuation orders, now's the time to finish preparations and get ready to hunker down. Understand that the rain may last for days and will be measured in some places in feet and not inches. The rain is going to last for days and potentially the winds, the strong winds, the duration of this is something we uh, have not seen uh, in a long time. Many people perhaps haven't seen this in their lifetime and hopefully will not have to once again. Once again, Hurricane Florence, still a major hurricane as it does approach the Carolina coastline here. I'm meteorologist Chris Warren here in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Coming up in just uh, a few minutes, we're going to talk with the mayor of Moorhead City, find out how things are going right now as uh, Moorhead is Moorhead City is just one of many cities that are going through this process of having to ask their residents to leave their home. Something that uh, may get lost at, at times, you know, when if you're not, you know, from the Carolinas, or you're not in an area where you are potentially impacted by hurricanes that people have to to leave their homes and they don't necessarily know when they're coming back. Yeah, it's a really big deal. There's no question about that. It's uh, something that people are not inclined to want to do. But there are cases where we want people to make sure they're out of harm's way. And in this case, because this storm is going to go on for such a long period of time, we're probably going to be dealing with the impacts for many, many days and weeks afterward. There you see the sustained winds at three locations and look how long they go on. They're starting very early on Thursday, uh, getting up to tropical storm forest. Then we get up to hurricane forest there for a long period of time in Wrightsville, North Carolina, dropping back to tropical storm forest uh, at some point uh, on Friday and then continuing even into Saturday. So because of that exceptionally long duration, we're going to be looking at uh, power outages, most likely trees that uh, wouldn't have fallen in the first, say, 12 hours or 24 hours. By the time you get to 36 and 48, they're finally going to go over and that's going to bring the power lines down. And so widespread power outages are expected. Marie, over to you. Carl, thank you. Myrtle Beach, basically a ghost town tonight. Tourists and residents are evacuating the coast ahead of Florence. Our Mike Bettis is in Myrtle Beach with the latest. Mike. Hurricane preparations coming to completion today in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. All businesses were asked to have uh, their businesses shut down by 5 o'clock today and secured. And then their employees uh, could be on their way if they needed to evacuate or they needed to get back to their homes and secure everything at their homes. As far as evacuations go, they've gone very smoothly here in Horry County and coastal South Carolina. Uh, as far as evacuations go with the lane reversals, now those are going to end on Thursday. And for I-26, when which all lanes were turned westbound, those are now go back to normal. East and westbound lanes beginning 6 p.m. on Thursday. And then for 501, which would be the main route to get out of uh, Myrtle Beach between um, Conway and Marion, it was all uh, westbound lanes. Those are now going to go back to normal lanes as of noon on Thursday, okay? Uh, the other thing about it is we're really concerned about, even though the, the hurricane in some senses has weakened a little bit, it's still a major hurricane, and what we're looking at is expanding wind field. And we think that power outages could be an issue. We could have power outages as far north as Virginia Beach to Raleigh, as far west as Asheville and Atlanta, and as far south as the coast of Georgia. So there's a large area we're now expecting because of the size of the wind field that's expanded and because of the slow motion of the storm, a lot of people, literally millions and millions of people that could be impacted by downed trees and power lines and power outages that could go on for days or weeks. Now the good news is that we're getting help, okay? 
a great stat for you here. 17 different states are sending as many as 40,000 electrical workers to the coasts here and to areas just inland that could be dealing with power outages. That, those are big numbers, and it's great to know that we are still the United States, and we're helping each other out in, when, our, when our fellow states need it, right? The three big impacts, wind is going to be one of them, lengthy power outages to come along with that, but storm surge and inland flooding. We think that state records could fall for rainfall from a tropical system in North and in South Carolina. But as of right now, great news to report here from Myrtle Beach that preparations are being completed. Emergency Operations Center fully operational and everyone that's been asked to evacuate has actually done it and done it in a very orderly fashion. That's the very latest here from the Grand Strand. I'm meteorologist Mike Bettis. Mike, thank you. And we're in it for the long haul. So when we talk about some of the more specific sites, just know that this is not going to be one and done, right? This is a threat that's going to be with us for days in some cases. When you look at rainfall as an example, this map goes through Tuesday. So we have Myrtle Beach on the higher end here, as much as a foot to a foot and a half of rainfall. Part of the story, though, if you look at a city like Charleston, where you have not only a push of water, but the rain and all of the rivers coming down into the city, slowing the drainage. So this is going to be a concern even though you have a city like Charleston with only four inches of rainfall. So Myrtle Beach, a couple of specifics here for the 40 mile per hour wind gusts really long period of time. We expect it between Thursday and into the end of the weekend, but those higher gusts really concentrating during the late day on Friday into Saturday, as much as a foot of rain to come, but also a storm surge up to six feet. Uh, so that is above already normally dry ground. Looking at the rainfall forecast for a city like Wilmington right now is the bullseye for that heaviest rain, upwards of two feet. Some of those may be on the more conservative side, but you can see how far inland that uh, foot of rain potential goes. Our live coverage of tracking more on the monster storm and what you can expect in the coming days. It is hurricane coverage you can trust. The forecast tells us that Florence's storm surge will drown many homes. There'll be trees down, there'll be power lines down. Uh, our, uh, some areas will be inaccessible for a period of time. This is a mandatory evacuation. Back up, go, it's time. Do not wait till tomorrow. Time is just about out to get out with Hurricane Florence now bearing down on the Carolinas. We know that is going to be a fact tomorrow. There will be where I am right here in Moorhead City impacts. We're gonna see the winds really start cranking for hours, if not days. And in a couple of days, what happens after that? That is still a huge question mark. I'm meteorologist Chris Warren, and we do have team coverage here at the Weather Channel tracking this monster of a storm, still a major Category 3 hurricane with maximum sustained winds at 115 miles an hour. We do have team coverage uh, with Dave Malkoff, who is in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, who is uh, going to talk to us about the uh, hurricane hunters. He flew with them, and we're going to hear about that. But the information... To this that leads to informed decision making and people preparing and getting ready based on the forecast a forecast that we saw several days ago knowing that this was a possibility and then as the days wore on we knew it wasn't just a possibility but a reality and now here we are it is wednesday night and thursday is the day thursday is the day we're going to start to get the first taste the first feel of hurricane florence and right now, someone who has uh, felt storms in the past, dealt with them, lived through them, Jerry Jones, mayor of Moorhead City, North Carolina. Now, first off, how, what's the process? It, when you look several days ago, see that this is coming, when you start pulling the trigger, how does that work? Well, you had a good segue coming in. It's not just a local decision now. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's a national decision. We have a hurricane hunters. We have our, our weather channels. We... You know, we have all our other networks. We have a lot of resources out now. I remember the, the, in the old days, they would tell stories. How do you know when the hurricane was here? It's when you could hear the ocean from Cedar Island. And, and that's when new, people knew back then, 100 years ago, they needed to get prepared. It's a lot different than that now. So we, we know days in advance on when the hurricane's coming. We know approximately what track it's going to be taking. So, so we, we get together and as, as a community, um, as, as a government, 
and we start analyzing this, this information and start making plans for that of when we should evacuate people, uh, when you open shelters up, uh, when you in, uh, impose curfews to keep people safe, to keep people off the streets. But, but times have changed and it, it makes it a whole lot safer for us now. So we're essentially at the eve of this storm now. Very much. And are we, I guess, is, is there any more decisions that need to be made or if the decision's been made and it's just now wait and see how things play out? Well, decisions have been made, but things are always subject to change. Um, I have been, we have a website, it's an internal website that, that if you're with the emergency services, we, we kind of communicate throughout the county. So we, we're checking out different areas, regions throughout the county and some of the low-lying areas, smaller communities, they have evacuated. So, you know, we, we won't have to worry about those areas, but there's still a lot, a lot of people that are left in Carter County. There's, you know, th there's different people that, that we govern and we, we nurture in, in our communities. Some people, you know, the, when they first heard the hurricane was coming, they just packed their bags and left. Some others, they kind of wait to hear, you know, from their, the leaders of the community what they should do, and then they heed those warnings. But then again, you got a couple other groups of people, some that maybe can't afford to, to leave town. Um, maybe their jobs won't allow them to leave. And then also you got some others, maybe some, some medically um, uh, homebound people. I was talking to a friend just, just a couple days ago and I asked him if he was going to leave Moorhead City and evacuate. He said, I can't. He said, my wife's home on oxygen. She wouldn't survive the trip. So these are, these are, this is reality. And so as, a, as local government, as a community, we, we, you know, we have to take care of our community. So although we get out, as we, we try to encourage evacuation as, ma as many people as we can, but we also know there's another facet of our population here that we have to look after. So evacuations? They're going, ongoing, and hopefully people are out now. Uh, but also the curfew. There's a uh, curfew goes into effect tomorrow. Is that still in pl the plan? That, that is correct. And the curfew is the curfew is for safety. Uh, it, 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 we're going to get a lot of sightseers that want to ride around. And but the primary reason for for a curfew is we're telling people you need to leave for safety reasons and 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 evacuate elsewhere to higher ground. Well, doing that that leaves their homes and their properties vulnerable. So we, we, we need curfews so we can help patrol these areas. And if we see a car in a neighborhood, we don't know if there's you know, somebody coming back home or if it's a looter in the neighborhood that's scoping out the place. And that way it gives the, the law enforcement around here the opportunity to really police the neighborhoods and protect people. All right, Jerry Jones, Mayor of Moorhead City, thank you so much. Thank we you. certainly appreciate you taking the time to come out. And best of luck to you, thank you. and everybody else. Another reminder, too, that there are people that are staying behind to help make sure that the people who couldn't get out are safe and to make sure that the people who did leave their property is also safe. Uh, still a long way to go with this storm and we're gonna be here with you on the Weather Channel. Be right back. We have uh, the likelihood of flash flooding but there's also storm surge flooding occurring in these same areas and this is where uh, this is headed. So in order to help you understand uh, why this is uh, such a uh, uh, significant flooding that's the same place on the left is earlier today before the hurricane arrived on the right is what's going on now live so that water has risen that's storm surge flooding and by the way we haven't even reached high tide yet in this part of the country that's coming over the next oh three hour three or four hours or so so this is going to get higher the water level is going to get higher because it's a continuous onshore push on the north side of the hurricane and we are headed toward high tide. So uh, this is why there was a storm surge warning not just on the Outer Banks but also uh, in the sounds and up the rivers. We, we talked about New Bern being one of the areas that could be uh, flooded by both storm surge and freshwater flooding when we uh, saw this coming yesterday. And so uh, that's why it, it's important to be listening to us if you are farther to the west and south where the hurricane is eventually headed. That kind of flooding could eventually happen in places like Wilmington along the South Carolina coast. Uh, river flooding could occur not just near the coast but inland as well. The center of circulation is not uh, something that we can depend on behaving itself and going right down the middle of that cone. It could come ashore and maybe come back over water, maybe make multiple landfalls. So all the way down to Charleston, South Carolina, you're not out of the woods for eventually getting uh, a direct effect from this uh, very slow moving hurricane. And so 
it, it's going to be frustrating, I know, for people to think that, you know, Alex, uh, like in places like Wilmington, right now you're not getting the worst of it, but you eventually will. And I really hope people aren't thinking, oh, uh, this isn't as bad as I thought. Uh, it's going to get a lot worse. And then after it goes right. by you, South Carolina could end up getting the worst. Really difficult when it's a long duration event like this. I was going to say that is one of the challenges of the messaging that uh, comes along with something that's so slow moving because I think people automatically tune into, okay, the onset and they knew things would get bad Thursday evening. And I think they're thinking, oh, so this is as bad as it gets. But unfortunately, because Florence is so large and so slow moving, it's a slow ramp up. Then it's going to be a very long period of activity and the most, uh, the most strong activity. And it's going to take a long time for this to wind down. So uh, conditions like what we have now, winds gusting around, if not over 50 miles an hour, between now and Saturday, we're talking 48 hours. So this is a long haul event for the city of Wilmington. As we go through tonight and Friday, that's when we could get on those hurricane force wind gusts, those winds that are exceeding 75 miles an hour at times. So power outages, that's concern number one. Two, surge, Dr. Nab just mentioned it. We're going to be watching this, the Cape Fear River tomorrow as those winds switch to more of a southerly direction. Now we're going to have that push northward. And so we will get up to six feet of surge flooding. Then the rain two feet or more possible. So fresh water surge. They're going to come together. That water is going to have nowhere to go. So exacerbating our flooding issues. Then, of course, we've also got to talk about the threat of severe weather. We just had a tornado warning north and east of here that was moving 85 miles an hour. These uh, tropical systems can bring these quick spin ups and they can move very quickly. So something to think about that if you did make the decision to stay here in the Wilmington area, that's something we'll be watching for. But of course, the biggest threat here, Mike Bettis, is that flash flood danger, that inland flood danger, river flooding for a long period because of just the incredible rainfall rates we're expecting. All right, so Alex, the deal is this, you know, for so many of us, it's the rain. And then how much flooding will we end up seeing? For a lot of us, it's going to end up being potentially record-setting amounts of rain that could drop foot, foot and a half here in a place like Myrtle Beach. And we can flood in a general summertime thunderstorm, okay, where you get maybe an inch of rain. Think about some of the heavy rainfall rates that could be produced by this, two, three inches an hour. And that could go on for hours on end meaning a lot of what's here is an island, okay? We've got the intercoastal, the Waccamaw River, which basically cuts off Myrtle Beach, it becomes an island. So you get storm surge flooding, rainfall flooding, and Myrtle Beach is completely inundated. Now we've had some uh, rain bands that have come in this evening, our first real taste, if you will, of Hurricane Florence. It's only gonna get worse from here as the heavy rain bands increase through the night tonight, through the day tomorrow. Could rain all day long tomorrow, okay? All day long. We may be setting state rainfall records here in South Carolina, but how far inland the rain goes is gonna depend on the exact track, okay? But already forecasting half a foot of rain, interior South Carolina and through the upstate as well. Accompanying the rain is going to be the wind. We're anticipating wind gusts over 75 miles an hour beginning later tomorrow, lasting through Saturday. And I think for a lot of us, that's becomes a problem because now we've saturated the soil, right? And so now we've loosened the root systems of our trees here, and now you bring in a big wind gust and down they go. All right, and then and the emergency managers here have said, remember, we can't send crews out there to do cleanup, to clear debris off of streets, to clean up trees, to repair uh, down power lines until the weather allows us to do that, okay? And so what you have to think about is, all right, well, the winds have to come down. You can't put someone up in a bucket truck. If the winds are 40, 50 miles an hour, uh, and you've got to do it safely so that roadways that the crews are on aren't flooded either. It could be a really laborious, long going, ongoing process for days to come and asking everyone to be patient in that regard. Also, by the way, I want to update you on this. They've suspended the contra flow here. So no longer do we have reversed lanes. So you'll be able to get back eastbound now on I-26 and 501 after the storm, okay? But you won't be allowed back in until they've done damage assessments, made sure that everything's clear for you to come in. And remember this, they'll set up uh, roadblocks, okay? And at those times, you'll have to produce an ID and proof of residency, something like a utility bill, so that you'll be allowed back in. Otherwise, you won't be allowed in, Mark. That's an important caveat to remember for those of you that evacuated and want to come back in. State-issued ID 
and proof of residency. Those are two very important things you need to have. It always takes longer than people want, but it's for good reason, because as you mentioned, that wind and the tree damage potential could be extensive with this storm. I mean, with the pressure of what, nine, between 950 and 955, and the wind's not increasing, it means that wind field is expanding and it's going over saturated grounds. We're gonna have a lot of trees that come down when all is said and done. So that is a big part of the story as Florence goes along the Carolina coast. Three quarters of a million people were evacuated out of North Carolina and big power outages have been reported in the Carolinas as well. More than 70,000 customers in the dark right now without power in North Carolina and the Pentagon has positioned 7,000 troops for relief, plus there are 40,000 power workers from the Carolinas and from other states ready to help in the aftermath as well. So that cleanup will get done, but it always takes longer than you want. And there are those backup points at the checkpoints, as Mike mentioned. Want to go out to Alex Wilson in a uh, much quieter than normal Wilmington, right? You think most people got out of town, Alex? <laughs> Yeah, apparently, you know, this is one of the most popular restaurants in town closed and I would say 95% of the businesses are closed boarded up. We did see a few bars open. Uh, there's a general store open as well as the Waffle House. They're still uh, keeping things going. Uh, they're very well known for not closing unless things are just so bad. And, and tomorrow, perhaps we could be looking at those uh, really uh, treacherous conditions with the rain, the strongest wind gusts, and of course, the surf potential here even in Wilmington up to six feet storm surge possible winds have been gusting around 50 miles an hour this afternoon and uh, this evening but Dr. Nab this is going to be a long duration event so the surge is go yet to come the strongest winds yet to come and of course the rain yet to uh, add up here in a place like Wilmington yeah so I want to talk about how the coastal areas uh, could uh, be affected over the next uh, few days by Florence you know, not just the beachfront but the coastal areas because as this hurricane moves along it's not going to be simply raking the beachfront okay and the heavy rainfall and the flash flooding will combine with storm surge flooding that gets into bays and gets up rivers so that we have a regional issue along the coast and so what we're already seeing starting to happen tonight is going to continue to happen tomorrow into Saturday. This is where flash flooding is likely. It's along the coast, but it's in the coastal region, but extending inland as well as the hurricane slowly makes its way to the west, we think, as it meanders. And then this problem uh, continues in the same general area as we go into the weekend. But so that flash flooding that's occurring in coastal regions is happening on top of the storm surge flooding that is expected to be in these ranges somewhere within those uh, outlined areas, including down into South Carolina over the next few days. And so I want to urge people in the coastal areas that have not gotten the worst of it yet, that this event is slow to unfold. We are about to make some history that no one wants to be a part of with historic rainfall totals, with catastrophic flooding, and don't assume that it's only going to be in eastern North Carolina. It could go farther down the coast. It could go into South Carolina. And then, of course, the inland effects will continue to unfold after Florence finally uh, goes inland at some point. So, so much for us to keep track of. Look at the live camera view here of the storm surge on the left, the heavy rainfall on the right, and this is just the beginning. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Weather Channel's continuing coverage of Hurricane Florence, a category two hurricane with 100 mile per hour winds and a surge that is causing issues. New Bern, North Carolina, stunning uh, pictures here of the water rise that we've had. Six feet of water rise here in New Bern, and normally you'd see steps down to the water here, a park. Everything is underwater tonight. This is what happens when you get a really strong onshore flow and you get water rises, not just at the coast, but up through the rivers as well. An incredibly dangerous situation in eastern North Carolina tonight as Florence is just lashing North Carolina. Eventually, as it comes ashore, parallels the coastline, it's going to share the wealth, unfortunately, with South Carolina. Staying with us here, everyone, I'm meteorologist Mike Bettis in Myrtle Beach, where 
off and on with the rain this evening. Heavy rain, though, likely to inundate us through the night tonight and likely through the day tomorrow. As much as a foot and a half of rain could be coming our way. It's a ghost town here, and it's that way in many places, including Wrightsville Beach in North Carolina. This is a place where potentially the center influence could go right over, maximizing the winds, maximizing some surge, maximizing the rain. Everyone's left. And that is uh, amazing to see that everyone is gone. They've heeded the evacuation orders as they should because for some of these places, it's a, a once-in-a-lifetime hurricane event. And when that kind of thing happens, um, you, you don't want to take any chances whatsoever. So many places are susceptible to flooding here in North Carolina and South Carolina, up and down the coastlines, truly. Uh, the beautiful places to be many times of the year. Reynolds Wolf has been to those uh, beaches many, many times. And, and barring hurricanes, Reynolds, they're fantastic. Beautiful, natural be beaches, uh, beautiful dunes. They're fantastic, right? Very, very peaceful. But all hell breaks loose when a hurricane comes. And even down in a place like Charleston, you know it very, very well, a place that goes underwater with ba barely a drop of rain. Oh, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, this is one of those places, one of the prettiest places in America that at time, um, from time to time, does deal with very rough weather. And, you know, they're, they're veterans, aren't they? I mean, they've been doing it quite a bit. I mean, you had Hugo back in 89. They've had a long history of rough weather. If you look over this building over here, just to my, in front of me, uh, Matt Saver's the man behind the camera. Matt, if you show America what we have on the lower floors and mid floors, you'll notice something that's a little bit amiss, some plywood. Even on the other building, the one that's more of a pastel color, you'll see all buildings, or rather all levels, you've got some of that. Uh, that up but I'll tell you that's to help protect against some of the wind another big issue that we have obviously is storm surge Dave Malkoff talks a bit about that take a listen using this map we are about to take a look at a before the storm view of two areas around Charleston South Carolina that could have potential problems with storm surge we hopped in our weather channel mobile unit plugged the coordinates into Google Maps and headed out to the first location just a few minutes from the downtown area. You've arrived. Looks like it's right about there. This is our first location in Charleston where you could see up to six feet in inundation from storm surge, worst case scenario. Looks like it is just an open field. As we go to the Little Planet virtual reality mode, you can see that we've got the 17 bridge that goes over to Mount Pleasant. Behind those trees, there's a student housing complex. This building over here is a recycling plant. But for the most part, this area looks like it's undeveloped. Okay, on to location number two. Ten minutes from the first location. Again, look at the map. Potential storm surge from Hurricane Florence around Charleston, South Carolina. You can see there are many areas prone to flooding. These are just some areas where the risk is higher. Our second location where you could get worst case scenario up to six feet of storm surge is right in the heart of downtown Charleston. You can see from our virtual reality view that we've got the Carnival Cruise Port over here, some warehouses, bars and restaurants all over this area. This is much more populated than the area that we saw before, but these two areas could possibly see a lot of storm surge here in Charleston. Only time will tell. And what's more, as we bring in Dr. Nab, when you think about what you have with Charleston uh, being located on the peninsula, you've got the Ashley Cooper Rivers, the same time Charleston Harbor, the chance of flush, uh, fresh water flooding and also salt water flooding. Uh, Dr. Nab, a huge mess, but I know you're also following flooding inland and on top of that, the possibility of, well, what may be the reality of wind damage. Yeah, and it's so important to keep people in Charleston taking this as seriously as they have been because just just because it's up in North Carolina's uh, coastal area right now doesn't mean it can't come down and have a southward component of motion and have a very significant effect on Charleston, including with storm surge and at the very least with winds and heavy rainfall because of this potential track area, including Charleston. Uh, we just don't know how uh, it's going to move exactly with respect to the coastline. It could go very uh, much along the coast for a significant part of its uh, uh, weekend here before finally going inland for good. So there's a storm surge watch still in effect for Charleston with the uh, distinct possibility that we get two to four feet of storm surge flooding somewhere in that part of the coastline 
above normally dry ground. And if it gets clearer that we're going to have maybe three feet or more, then some of that area might have to uh, go under a storm surge warning. So again, uh, it's a slowly evolving disaster here. It's just beginning here in North Carolina. The center is offshore, but hurricane force winds are already on land. We're going to talk to the inland folks here in a little bit, but look at Surf City, North Carolina. The winds are howling. Those are the sights and the sounds of Hurricane Florence, a Category 2 hurricane getting closer and closer to the shore. I'm literally sitting just off the coast of North Carolina tonight with 100 mile per hour winds, and we've got team coverage for you lined up in North Carolina and South Carolina, including a meteorologist Reynolds Wolf, he's in Charleston, South Carolina. Meteorologist Alex Wilson, she's in Wilmington, North Carolina. Our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Nav at the Weather Channel headquarters, breaking down the very latest and what's going on with this storm tonight. We've also got meteorologist Mark Elliott for you tonight. I'm Mike Bettis coming to you from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where the, the winds have picked up tonight, but the rain has let up, but heavy rain will impact us for at least the next 36 to 48 hours. One place that's been really getting hit hard today is North Carolina. Alex is there. Alex, the conditions are only going to get worse there in Wilmington, a city that's susceptible to flooding, and then wait for the winds to pick up. That could get incredible overnight tonight and tomorrow. Yeah, we've seen some strong gusts already today, uh, up around 50 miles an hour, but we know that's just the beginning of what's yet to come. And by the way, already getting reports of power outages, customers without power here in Wilmington. So at those 50 mile per hour gusts, knowing that we've lost power for some, we know what's coming. 75 plus mile per hour gusts overnight and through the day Friday. So that means more power outages anticipated here. And then we've got to talk about the water. The water will probably be the biggest danger from this storm. We'll be watching for a surge up to six feet. But what I'm especially concerned about is how that combines with the freshwater flooding, the rain that's still yet to come. Right now, we're dealing with some light to moderate rain at times. Rain's going to continue as we get into the start of our weekend all the way into Saturday. So we are going to be watching for over two feet of rain to likely fall across this area. Now areas where you have surge that and the water that's coming down, it's going to have nowhere to go. So that's going to lead to flooding. But of course, anytime you're talking about two feet of rainfall, you know that you are up against flash flooding concerns even away from the water. So a lot of communities are going to be dealing with a very serious and significant threat of river flooding, of flash flooding. And so they are prepared. You know, we talked to uh, the chairman of the county commission here and he said, you know, we're ready for anything. Uh, we're ready to rescue folks should the need arise. And, you know, we're already getting reports of even a TV news station that's had to uh, leave because of the water coming up. So big problems already. And now, uh, Mike, we know that this is going to be, you know, Dr. Nesson saying a marathon, not a race. This is going to be a long duration event and places like Myrtle Beach will get in on it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any question that we're going to get days of rain here. Flooding rain is almost a certainty at this point. Uh, I think storm surge is questionable. It's really going to depend exactly where the eye goes, whether or not we get the surge. If the, if the, if the eye goes more in, I think that minimizes the surge impacts. If it stays offshore, I think it maximizes the surge impacts, and the winds are going to pick up, and they'll just increase through the day tomorrow. So a lot of things going to be happening for us, right? Hey, I want to show you some new video that we have out of Jacksonville, North Carolina. Winds coming in there, and how about the power surges there and the sparking? A lot of times what will happen is you end up getting um, high winds that, you know, knock off a tree limb or something like that. They'll hit power lines and then those power lines will arc and they'll spark and you'll see that. Uh, if you see something that's like a blue color, a green color or purple color, it's usually a power line that's sparking. If you see something that's an orangish color or reddish color, that may be a transformer on fire. Generally, transformers don't explode, but they can catch fire because they have uh, combustible material inside and some oils. But when you see the sparking, that's generally a piece of debris hitting a power line. They call that arcing. Uh, and we can see a lot of that. A lot of times you'll get 
you know, small pieces of debris that eventually, when the winds really pick up, you get big pieces of tree, and they just eventually take down power lines, and, and we lose a lot of power that way. Sometimes power poles themselves will just snap. You get pine poles, and they'll just uh, snap right on over. Uh, hopefully, we can avoid any serious issues with large transmission lines, um, but, you know, be prepared. Be prepared to go without power for a lengthy period of time. I mean, do you have your flashlights ready to go? Lanterns? Do you have backup batteries? Don't use open flames. That's for sure. Avoid using open flames pretty much at all costs. Do you have a generator? Do you have enough gas for your generator? Are you storing that gas in the right place? Are you operating your generator a safe distance from your house, away from doors, out of the garage? Don't do it in the garage. Keep it away from windows and patio doors. At minimum, 15 feet away from your house is the best way to uh, to use it. And make sure that the exhaust is pointing away from your house and not toward your house. Okay, uh, just a few tips there to help you get through this and, and, and have the conveniences that we all enjoy of modern day electricity. But power outages could be extensive from Georgia to South Carolina to North Carolina, maybe even portions of Virginia. Be ready for that. Hey, when we come back, folks, more from Reynolds Wolf in South Carolina, Alex Wilson in North Carolina, and our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Knapp. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to our coverage here. My goodness, remember this view from earlier in the day if you've been watching all day. Surf City, North Carolina, that is an American flag getting absolute, actually that looks like a hurricane flag now. Earlier in the day, there was an American flag up. They must have changed it out somehow at some point. My goodness, even that is getting just pounded, right? Hurricane force winds are slamming the coastline, continuing to move ever so slowly further towards the west, further towards the south, impacting more and more people with these winds and the impacts continue to grow. Not only are we seeing horizontal rain and the wave action increasing, but the severe weather component is increasing as well. I'm meteorologist Mark Elliott. I want to show you this tornado watch. It goes until 9 o'clock over eastern North Carolina, but well outside of this zone, about halfway outside the watch to Raleigh is a new uh, uh, warning. It's all the way out here, right? Here's the center of our storm and the outermost band that still has some significant shower and thunderstorm activity with it is giving us this tornado warning. It's outside of the Spites Bridge area. Wilson County goes until 9 o'clock. A fast moving tornado warning, but not quite as fast as some of the ones closer to the center, right? Where the, those bands are whipping around. Closer to the center, we had tornado warnings moving close to, say, uh, uh, what was it, 85 miles per hour earlier. This one closer to 35. You notice right in here, the reds and greens uh, next to each other. And I'm going to have to update this because it just moved as I was talking to you. So here is the latest uh, area of concern right through here. Uh, and we're going to uh, really have to... Um, update these because they're moving so quickly. So here we go. Here's some of the timing for you. Black Creek at 844, Watson Crossroads at 856, Hickory Crossroads at 903 for this area of concern with this potential tornado. Uh, one of many that will still be at play through the rest of the evening, I'm sure. So again, our area of uh, uh, concern with Florence is all the way over here. Uh, notice all of this is onshore flow, right? And the waters have started to really pile up. Uh, storm reports starting to come in close to the coastline, including some of these storm surge at the Noose River over uh, East Front Street in New Bern. Uh, storm surge street flooding now on Shore Drive in Havelock and uh, also overwash on North Topsail Beach. That was a little bit earlier today, but you got to imagine that is still continuing. Yeah, and then, of course, the power outages continue to grow. North Carolina now with 90,000 90, outages, mostly because of a big jump here in Craven County. That's the, the addition onto the map, uh, about 12,000 of you on top of the 54,000 customers without power in Carteret and a smattering of other counties as well. So Alex, now up to 90,000 customers without power in North Carolina. That will only continue to grow. And I know I've seen some lights around you throughout your live shots, but uh, as those storms move towards you, power is going to be a big problem there as well. Yeah, I think more power outages are going to be coming into play here in Wilmington. We already have some. In fact, uh, those stronger wind gusts, they're, they're less few and far between than they were, say, at the start of this. We're now beginning to see a uh, more consistent, you know, every few seconds you get some stronger gusts. And when they come uh, right around 50 miles an hour, we know that's going to ramp up as we get into the overnight hours and through the day Friday. That's when our uh, period of strongest wind gusts will be. So we're talking about 24 hours of really strong winds 
we could still be seeing those gusts at or over 50 miles an hour into Saturday. So it's a long term event and that's why the concern for power outages is so high. This isn't just, you know, a few hours of strong winds and then it's done. Instead, it's a long period of those battering winds. And then the water, of course, will be a huge concern. We think rainfall rates will be on the order of two to three inches an hour as we get some of those heavier bands coming in over the next few hours. So I think overnight uh, we're going to be seeing a whole different scene here in the Wilmington area. Mike Bettis in uh, Myrtle Beach. Things are really going to be ramping up as we head into the day tomorrow. Indeed they are. We're going to have an increased winds, we're going to have increased rain, and the possibility we could get some pretty significant storm surge here depending on where the track of the eye goes. A couple things to update you on here in Myrtle Beach. Curfew is in effect, so dusk to dawn curfew, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. You need to be at home and staying put. Uh, and uh, first responders doing patrols tonight, and they say aggressively enforcing curfew tonight. Here along the boardwalk, we just saw two foot patrol officers uh, checking it out. There's nobody out here, uh, so that's good. Also, we've got uh, six shelters open here in Horry County, housing 2,000 people right now, and those numbers expected to go up across the state. More than 50 shelters are open right now. Some of them are already at capacity, so if you're still thinking about going to a shelter, um, I may call ahead and see if they have uh, availability for you. And remember, you need to take your own bedding with you because they're not providing bedding at the shelter. So if you want to be comfortable, take your pillow and take your blanket with you. They're just yeah, they're there to save your life, in essence, Dr. Nab. That's basically what the shelters are for. They're not there to be a you know, five-star resort hotel. They're just there for you to have a safe place and a dry place so that you don't uh, get injured or harmed in any way by the hurricane. The highest priority by far is life safety, and it's going to be testing our nerves and our endurance to ride out a long duration storm. But that's what we were faced with, with the flooding rains, the storm surge flooding and the winds. Uh, we've got flash flood warnings in effect there in eastern North Carolina, likely to very likely devastating flash flooding uh, through tomorrow morning. And that's going to be just the beginning. And by the way, there's the possibility of flash flooding on the Texas coast and in the Houston area. And that expands inland as we go into the weekend. So don't drive across any water covered roads. Don't drive around a barricade. Stay out of floodwaters completely. Evacuate if you're told to do so on short notice. And if you're trapped by floodwaters, call 911. Don't touch anything electrical. That's wet. Stay safe. Storm surge expected could be six to nine feet, even more than that. Stay on guard. This is a powerful storm that can kill. Winds gusting over 50 miles per hour. Water has risen to over a half foot, and this is just the beginning. North Carolina. It's getting difficult to even stand out. Welcome back into our continuing coverage of Hurricane Florence. Uh, we do have some somewhat breaking news. We are 10 miles from the worst of the weather, the worst of the eye wall with this thing. Our conditions have been deteriorating pretty steadily here over the last, let's say, 30 minutes. And then we're about 20 uh, miles from the center circulation, the eye. It does look like that eye will go over us here into Wilmington as this thing slowly moves ashore. These are the type of gusts we're getting. but. When that worst part of the eye wall comes in that's 10 miles from us, then that means you're going to see those very strong winds consistently. The other problem we're dealing with right now, significant issues in the New Bern, 200 rescues, 150 people waiting to be rescued, and we have a resident who is trapped in his home in New Bern. The Noose and Trent Rivers are up. We've had 10 feet of inundation. Tom Balance joining us on the phone. Tom, thank you so much for being with us under such circumstances. Tell us how high the water is where your home is. Well, my home is on the noose, and, and even though I might be trapped, I mean, I'll be able to get to the second floor, so I'm not going to die. But uh, I'm about 250 feet from the river on a slope upward, and it comes up about 10 feet, and uh, the water now is about 50 feet from my uh, doorstep. Okay, so how quickly has it come up? Well, it started out real quick, and then for the last uh, three or four hours, it's come up about maybe two feet an hour maybe it's what it's done is it's hit a ridge and it's trying to get over the ridge and once it gets over the ridge it'll get here pretty quick okay so how long have you lived in that house and have you ever seen flooding like this <laughs> i've lived in it since 2003 and uh, we've stayed for every hurricane this time i sent my wife and my daughter and everybody else they live behind us to atlanta 
and I've never ever. But see, I'm from Newburn too, and when I was a little boy, my parents walked me around downtown after Hazel hit, and all I remember was a bunch of fallen trees. But this is uh, this is the worst I've ever seen, because I have a business on Middle Street, and in all the years, nothing's ever flooded Middle Street. That's been the one street. And even though I haven't made it downtown, I've been listening to the police radio, and uh, sounds like Middle Street's underwater. So it's a double whammy here. Wow. Yeah, it is. So have you been able to hear anything else either on the police scanner, or have you been communicating with other friends? You, can you report anything else coming out of New Bern right now? Uh, out of New Bern, no. Matter of fact, the only people commuting uh, are talking to me are people from somewhere else, like Atlanta, from... Uh, Greensboro from uh, everywhere else but Newburn. I haven't heard anything from Newburn. My next door neighbors, I know they all stayed and I'm a little worried about them, but they've got second floors too. Nobody was expecting this. Nobody. We were fools. So, do, do you have a plan if the water continues to rise? What is your plan for the coming hours? Plan B is go to the second floor. And then I'll be eight feet above this. I think I'm okay, okay then. That's my plan. Okay. Well, please take please take care of yourself. Call 911 if you need rescue. They are rescuing people there. The city says we will come to get everybody. And just please stay safe and take care of yourself. Uh, wow, what a story there from Tom. Just tremendous. You might have seen me look back. I just heard some big bang. Now we're hearing some sort of honking going on. I don't know what it was. It's dark. And this is a tough part about going through these storms when it's dark like this. You just can't see much. We do have protection, okay? We absolutely have protection from the storm. Again, we're only miles from the worst of the weather from this Category 1. And this is why we say, you know, everyone's freaked out when it's a Category 4. When it's a Cat 2 and it's Cat 1, you still are seeing damage. And it is still very strong winds. Winds here in Wilmington gusting to 74 miles an hour, and we're not even yet into the middle of the worst of the weather. In North Carolina, a quarter of a million people are without power. The American Cajun Navy is calling for more boats for rescues in New Bern. We did speak to the city officials there. They said they will come get everyone. You can bring your pets. All right, so if you're talking to someone in New Bern, they can bring pets. You cannot bring pillows and luggage and uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, there are reports of roofs blown off a store in New Bern, gas station canopy blown off in topsail. So we are seeing some of those structural damage, damages that are starting to come in. We have seen wind gusts into uh, Beaufort, north of here, 99 miles an hour. And again, once this eye wall rotates down to us, we will see that consistent, strong wind. And then, by the way, once this all passes, we will see consistent rain and that onshore flow. So we are going to see more of this. And by the way... We could see rain until Monday here in the eastern North Carolina. Live team coverage, 24 hours a day. We'll keep you safe throughout Hurricane Florence. We'll be right back. We are just miles from the eye wall here in Wilmington, North Carolina. The wind has picked up. The rain is picked up as well. We have not seen this much rain so far. You hear that wind howling? My microphone picks it up, but you can hear it howling down the street. We are watching for trees. We're watching for debris, stuff like this. It's going to get worse, though, before it gets better here in Wilmington. That type of stuff, guys, we aren't even in the worst of it. I'm looking at my radar right here to keep track of it. So stay tuned because we are about to get into the eye wall, which is the worst of the weather. It is wind and rain for us here in Wilmington, but in New Bern, it is rescues ongoing all night long. 200 people rescued, 150 waiting to get picked up, and we want to now go to Kyle uh, Metcalf, who is in New Bern, and he is with some of the water rescue teams. So, Kyle, uh, how has the night been progressing? How many, uh, what are you guys doing right now? Right now, the uh, fire department is going door to door uh, along the uh, river here. Um, you can smell petroleum in the air as well. Uh, but they're going door to door and knocking on uh, all the houses along the river to make sure everybody's out. Okay. Woo, sorry, we're just getting some good wind gusts here uh, as we're about to go into the eye wall. So, how many, do you know how many teams are out there rescuing people? What have you seen when uh, it comes to rescue? Is it fire? Is it neighbors? Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, they're actually firemen. Uh, they brought in a uh, school bus and they packed them with a bunch of firemen, and uh, they're actually uh, setting up teams going down each street, and uh, they're knocking on all the doors, make sure everybody's out, and make sure everybody's safe at this point in time. The river's still rising. Uh, the water keeps on getting higher and higher. Okay, so how high have you seen it? We have had reports that the Noose and the Trent River has inundated 10 feet up. I personally have a friend in New Bern who has told me, she's on the Trent River, that the water is lapping up to the window on her first floor. Um, have you, what reports have you heard about the water level? Um, I'm actually at uh, Root in High Street in uh, New Bern, and the water is up to their waist, up to the apartment's uh, waist as they wade through the water. Do you know where they are bringing all these evacuees to? Right now, they have not extracted anybody. I have not seen anybody come out of their homes yet. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Kip, we certainly appreciate it. Please stay safe out there, and thank you for the work that you're doing and the reporting that you're bringing to us here at the Weather Channel. Again. The eye wall is going to be coming into uh, Wilmington here. If we show you the radar, you can see when you look at the radar, okay, just so you know what you're looking at here, where you see the deeper oranges and the red colors on the radar, that's going to be the heavy rain, and that's where you're going to see those stronger winds. That's the eye wall. Where the, where the radar is void of anything, you hear it? Where the radar is void of anything, that is the eye. That's where the winds will calm down. And I believe here in Wilmington, we are we are probably going to get into that eye. I don't know if we'll get right into the center, but we might get into a bit of it. You will see such a difference. It's something to experience, to go through an eye wall where you get horrific wind for quite a while. Then you get the calm wind in the center, in the eye. Now, here's what I've always noticed. Okay, I've been on the Weather Channel 15 years, numerous hurricanes. What happens with the first eye wall is it loosens up everything, okay? Then you have the eye, it's calm. Then you get through the second eye wall, and that's when the debris starts flowing around. So don't be fooled that it's over once you get into the eye. That's happened in past hurricanes where people have been in the eye and then they go out thinking, okay, it's done, it's gone. That is not what happens. And this is not a Floyd. This is not racing through. This is we're going to get slammed, and then we're going to get the eye, and then we're going to get hit again with the other eye wall. And it's only moving five, six miles an hour. Do you remember the, was it, the beginning of the week when this thing was moving 17 miles an hour? It was racing along. No, we're only at five, six, so it is crawling. So it's going to be an extended thing. Now, here in Wilmington, there have not been reports of flooding, none that I have seen that I can report nor that I've heard of. The Cape Fear River, okay, which is just a few blocks from us, we have a north wind because we've been on the west side of this storm. And that's why we're not getting that inundation like they are in New Bern. New Bern has had an east wind. And just when you hear meteorologists say that, an east wind means the wind goes from the east and pushes west. So that's what's been happening in New Bern. An east wind has been taking the water from the Atlantic and then pushing it up the sound and into the Noose and the Trent River and the New Bern area. Here we've been getting a north wind, so that means the Cape Fear River is getting pushed out. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to stay live for you here as this continues to creep towards the coast. It's going to take a minute because it's moving so slowly. But watch for those winds. We've seen wind gusts here to 74 miles an hour. Quarter of a million people are without power in North Carolina. Carteret County has seen a foot of rain that's come down. And that rain, by the way, is going to continue. We've started that. We have to keep saying it's going to slow down. Well, guess what? It's slow down. And now we're going to rain here until probably Monday. Not like this, but that rain's going to continue, and we're actually going to get more of an onshore push. So it's not always about the rain and the wind, all right? Because in New Bern, they, they had flooding 12 hours ago when they didn't really have rain. It's about the push of water. But we are about to push in to the eye wall of Florence right now. You see the difference right there? And we were going to take a quick break, and then we will be back. It's not very long. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to take a breath. We'll be in the eye wall. We'll stay live once we're, you know, in that eye wall, going to the eye for that landfall here with a Category 1. This is a Category 1 hurricane, people. All right? A Category 1. Live team coverage will continue. Please stay put. Please stay safe. I promise to keep myself and the crew safe if it gets too bad. Picked up. The rain has 
been consistent, and this is the type of debris that we have seen. Trees splitting in two. Now, we're not even in the worst of the weather yet. I'm watching it here on radar. Sorry, so I just heard something. I'm watching this on radar, and it does look like we are going to get into the eye of Hurricane Florence here into Wilmington. Places like Topsail, we've seen winds gusting 80, 90 miles an hour. Our latest gust we've had here, 74 miles an hour. And let me tell you, it's going to get worse before it gets better because this isn't even the core of the eye wall. Remember, the eye wall is surrounding the eye. The eye is calm. Watch. Stay with us. You're going to see this. You're going to check back in in a little bit. Let's say uh, maybe an hour or so, maybe a little longer than that, and it's going to be calm. You will be able to see stars, whatever. It, it's incredible what happens. But right around the eye is the eye wall, and it is the worst weather in any hurricane. Now imagine, this is a Category 1 hurricane, and this is what we're dealing with. Okay, so, you know, when we talk about it, you know, downgrading, this is why yesterday on air, all of our meteorologists and Kentori and I were saying you can't pay attention to that because this is what happens even with a Category 1. So it is going to continue to go downhill, but I know it's time for a tropical update. I want to toss it to Jen. Jen, we're going to take a quick breath. Maybe you can give some more detail on the forecast, where it's going for everybody else, and everything that else is happening in the tropics. I mean, Seth, it just, it looks awful, right? And that's a category one. I'm watching your feed. I'm watching your shot. Um, and, you know, that wind is yet to get stronger for Stephanie there. You know, I'm here in Myrtle Beach where it has really been a game of patience for the last three days because people evacuated on Tuesday. The weather was fine. Wednesday, the weather was fine. Even yesterday, the weather was fine. Now, last night, the wind started picking up and it's been ongoing, gusting over about 40 miles per hour here, pretty much nonstop. And by the end of all this, you're going to be saying, make the wind stop. It is going to be relentless. So I want to just give you a, you know, a little picture of what's happening. I'm on the beach, and I wanted to show you actually what the beach looks like once the sun comes up here today. But right now, you can just get um, you know, a semblance of what's happening by watching the sea oats behind me. They are blowing from offshore. So the wind is coming from the northwest and it's blowing out towards sea. So that means here in Myrtle Beach and really all the way anyone who is to the left of Florence is going to be getting this offshore wind and sand as I'm getting and that's going to keep the sea out. You're not going to be dealing with the surge yet until we get into that onshore flow. All right, certainly though, if you're on that eastern side, you're getting that push of water. It's going all the way up the news. These new scenes coming in from New Bern right now where, of course, people have been rescued. Now animals are being rescued as well. So we can show you those new pictures that are coming in. 200 people rescued in that area. 150 more need rescuing. They are, this is an active rescue this morning. Call 911 if you need assistance and they will come out to get you. But you can see that, look how high the water is. That guy, that water is up to uh, almost, almost the uh, his thighs anyway. On this gentleman walking through that water, he's got a flashlight. He's uh, obviously looking for people who need assistance. And if you do need assistance, know that you can take your pets with you, which I think is phenomenal, right? Just phenomenal because people are always very hesitant to leave if they can't take their pets. All right, let me uh, let me talk about the rainfall. So some of the biggest rainfall totals so far have been on the eastern side of the system. Steph's going to get into some of that too, with just the slow movement of this thing. It is Florence is moving at only five miles per hour. It's it's pretty much stalled. And you know what's what's amazing is actually the models predicted this, predicted this that we would get you know this hurricane um, and it would approach the coast and it would just sit there. And that's what's happening. And so we are going to end up with feet of rainfall. A foot of rain, not impossible. In fact, I think pretty likely for a lot of you, but two feet of rain is also quite possible and maybe even more because of the slow movement of this system. Now look at the track. So you see this track and we're going to see it move into South Carolina. That's going to put us here in uh, Myrtle Beach on that side where we get the onshore flow that'll bring in the moisture that's going to keep that tropical tap, that connection. And then we see it make a turn and it gets steered around up through eastern Tennessee, get through West Virginia, Ohio, getting into the northeast, uh, into Pennsylvania, where, you know, that is an area that certainly does not need and can barely handle a drop more of rainfall. So that will be a concern as well. But we'll get to that. We are days away because this is a slow moving system. So just going through today, I mean, you're, you're in the rain. Steph is, you know, waiting landfall of Florence. Uh, it's it's going to take a while. It's just moving so, so slow across this area. All right, so this is the forecast 
for the river gauges across the region. Obviously, in New Bern, the Neuse River is up. Uh, down into South Carolina, we're still waiting for those water levels to rise and anticipating that because of the rain. And especially once we get into a surge component here, we'll watch for that as well. So all of those in purple are the ones that we are waiting and watching for. All right, let's check back in with Steph. All right, Jen, we've just been consistently getting our gusts. We're now gusting to 82 miles an hour in Wilmington. The, the fastest gust we had before that was only 74. And we are still, we are not in the worst of it yet as I'm looking at the radar here. Stay tuned. We'll stay live as long as it's safe to do so right here on the Weather Channel.